Good afternoon. Welcome to the Pasquale Project. I am your host, Zeb Pasquale. This is it. This is the episode. Uh, I'm really excited about this one because if it wasn't for my past episodes and my future episodes, arguments can be made that the entire podcast section of the Pasquale Project was created for the sole purpose of recording this one episode. <laughs> and the reason why is because whenever my next guest and I get together, we love, first of all, we love and relish physical training, CrossFit style, anaerobic, heavy stuff. But there hasn't been a hangout that we've had that I, where I didn't walk away from it feeling more uh, humbled and wanting to be a better man and be a better human and more hopeful for the world and hopeful for the future. We've known each other for over 10 years. We've watched each other grow through just as many professional pursuits. Uh, there, At least on my end, and I'm pretty sure it's mutual, there is an enormous natural and mutual respect between us both, uh, personally and professionally. And one of the reasons I think we get along is because, I'm going to just go ahead and say it, I think our philosophical and pedagog pedagogical DNA is almost identical. We see the world almost, very, almost identically as far as our outlook, and the way we teach it to others and share it to others is also almost like word for word, blueprint for blueprint, the same. And I think we connect on that on so many levels. Uh, but what I think makes our conversations dynamic and for me fun is because on a personal level, our needs and our wants are extremely divergent, both consciously and subconsciously. And I, ha I always have a kick out of it. Um, at this point, after having done multiple podcasts, I did not want it. This meant so much to me. I did not want him to be my first podcast. I wanted to I wanted to come into it having practiced and worked out the cobweb, cobwebs and worked out the kinks through other episodes. That doesn't take away at all from all the other episodes because they were all special and I love them all and I will continue to do this. But uh, the last time I saw him was in New York and I knew when we were talking that I wanted and needed to record an episode with him, us together talking because it's only fair. There's everyone, pretty much everyone is doing it, it feels like. And everyone has so many good things to say. I listen to a, a lot of them, not just on podcasts, but on YouTube. And I, I learned so much from what I consider modern day, my modern day mentors who have opportunities to share. And so much of that has contributed to the mission and philosophical outlook of the Pasquale Project itself. And I, I, I knew I needed to do it. I knew I needed to do this. And I knew that it was it was going to be important for him, me and maybe important for him and his endeavors uh but here we are now and it's it's crazy to me so i'm gonna go ahead and we have so much to talk about and so much to say i've been blessed with an amazing and striving life packed to the brim with extraordinarily intelligent courageous and successful people with whom i've had the honor to experience on a virtually daily basis loud victories crippling defeats thrilling adventures pioneering travels and quiet moments of introspection discussion and learning Many of these times belong to us forever in our memories, but sometimes they scream to be shared. This is one of those times. It is my honor to present episode six with former professional MMA fighter, former CrossFit gym owner and trainer, current acupuncturist practitioner, author, TEDx speaker, entrepreneur, consultant, men's coach, founder of the Man Uncivilized Movement, my brother, my friend, Trevor Bohm. What's Holy up, man? smokes, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have you follow me around yes. everywhere I go. And just, and just say that, yeah. yeah. Like, so if I sit down in a restaurant, you're like, <clears throat> and yeah. you can just start, and like, I would like the chicken, please. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> I'll be the enforcer, the royal enforcer. Everyone stand and remain standing. <laughs> remain standing. Wow, thanks, brother. Yeah, man. I, I'm really excited for this. Um, yeah, it's I'm, a long I'm, time coming. I didn't. I also didn't want. I didn't want this to be an online thing. Yeah. Um, Chris Mello, if you're listening, we will still do the Skype thing online. I'm. I'm looking forward to learning how to do that. But all my guests, I wanted to be in person. Yeah. You know, and I knew I needed this to be in person. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so, <clears throat> you've done a lot. You've done a lot of. You've done a lot of podcasts and interviews up until this point. Mm -hmm. This is still kind of a new world to me, but I'm having so much fun. Uh, before we before we dive in, could you give like a quick or shotgun summary of where you're from and what your background is before we before we dig into uh like you know crossfit and the, and the man on civilized stuff like where were you sure. born where sure sure from? sure uh i was born in wilton connecticut and lived there up until fifth grade okay where my family then moved to tokyo for five years uh moved back to connecticut 
and I stayed there until I went to college in Boston and finished college, moved out here to California, experienced the very first winter where I didn't have to scrape ice off my windshield yep. and a sweatshirt and beanie were like, oh, it's cold weather gear. And yeah. it was like, F this. I'm never going back to the East Coast. Yeah. Uh, fell in love with surfing, fell in love with the ocean and lived in California for the last 20 years in LA and then Santa Barbara for a number of years uh, before taking off on an adventure in 2016 that took me all around the world and has now landed me randomly in Brooklyn, New York. Awesome, man. Uh, Trevor and I have seen each other through so many different things. Mm. Um, it's I, 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 I actually wrote this outline here, and even still, looking at it, I it's very hard for me to know where to start. But let's just start where with the common thread. Sure. Where did you? How did you find out about CrossFit? I was in Thailand. I was in uh, Phuket, actually Chiang Mai, Thailand, man. I was training for Muay Thai there. Yeah. Uh, I took a year off of acupuncture school. So when I first got to acupuncture school, they had this class that went from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. One class, four wow. hours. And about three quarters of the way through the first year, I was like, I'm going to lose my goddamn mind yeah. sitting so much. I'm going to take a year off and fight. And so I went to Thailand, and there was a guy in the in my camp named Glenn Cordova. If you know that name, I do know the name. Yeah, he wrote. Um, awesome. He wrote "Way of the Supple Leopard" or yep. with Kelly. Yeah. He wasn't that guy then. He was sure. just a dude in Thailand. Awesome. And uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, he was my size, and we would we would train a bunch together, like instantly connected. Just another American, really cool guy, and um, we would wrestle every once in a while too like not just doing muay thai because he was a grappler oh and he was so much stronger than i was yeah yet we were the same size and, and i was like, like what dude the fuck? what are you doing yeah right and uh he literally had this conversation he was one of um rob wolf's students interesting way back when this is like when there were you know 10 gyms yeah and he goes when you get back to the states yeah check out this thing called crossfit oh it's shit. wild and yeah. i was like what is this nonsense? Yeah. It's like it's gymnastics, it's Olympic lifting. Yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. I'm still in there like doing bicep curls right. and, and uh, bench press in the gym. So came back to LA, was dating a girl, and I lived in Hermosa Beach. And she was like, nope, you're not doing any more activities. You seem to have 50 of them. Yeah. So stop that. Aww. We split up. And two days later, I walked into Patronic Fitness yep. in LA. What's up, Andy, if you're listening? Hey, Andy. This is, yeah, this is this, grown well. This is it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude. So th when, do you remember when that was? 2007. Okay. Yeah, because I joined in two, uh, January 2008, so 10 yeah. years into it. For most of my guests, I have a very distinct memory on when I first met them. But I, the, my first memory of you was when we were doing, <clears throat> it was... I was doing Fran against, at the time, my rival, Leo Bessina. I don't know, Leo, if you're even, like, around. <laughs> but I remember that. That was, you know, because, like, Fran is something every crossfit yeah. does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember my first ever Fran was, like, 1230. And then after that, it was, like, 10 minutes and then 8 yeah. minutes. And then, so this one I remember very clearly because it was 521. Not okay. my best Fran, but to this day, the Fran that I absolutely put everything I had into it. You know, it's yeah. very, it's very... You walk away from every workout. It's like, yeah, I could have put out here. I could have, yeah. out, I could have put it out there. It, truly, in my heart, that five twenty one friend was the one rare time when I literally gave everything gave I had. All. Me and Leo were rep for rep for the twenty one set mm -hmm. of thrusters, rep for rep for the pull ups, and the fifteen. We were just like hunched over, looking at each other to see who would pick up the bar <laughs> first. <laughs> but I remember you sitting on the parallel bars, our parallel thing, yeah. gymnastics thing, behind me, and saying just pick up the bar because it was so loud and people yeah. were just saying everything and your your heart rate's screaming you think you're having a heart attack and everything's just but i remember you saying like just pick up the bar pick up the bar and uh, you know it was so hard but yeah that was my first memory of you yeah. and then i remember you being a very staunchly a 6 a.m guy yeah uh and then yeah you, i think i went to one class in two years that wasn't at 6 a.m yeah, yeah yeah and then i i think uh i remember i went over to your pad and we talked about the zone diet or like dieting yes and then you got me into the zone yeah, yeah yeah remember that and then all of a sudden i think we hung out through mutual friends a few times i'm like man this guy is fucking awesome you know and it was one of those rare things where we connect on a lot of things and yeah. i remember you left and i think this was at a time when i was i was 
having trouble. I was in nursing school and mm. trying to navigate what CrossFit meant to me at the time. I had no aspirations to be a trainer or an owner right. then. I just knew I loved it and everything made sense. And then all of a sudden you were going to Santa Barbara to open up your own gym. Yeah. And I think that kind of opened my eyes. I was like, wow, this could actually happen. And then, and then I remember just trying to go and support you as much as I could. And yeah, I think yeah, I went yeah. to your first... You were there at our grand opening? Yeah, yeah, yeah grand yeah, opening, yeah. yeah. So You were there at my very first class. The very first class, right. it was and Angie, you, yeah, you yeah, I remember that. Yep. Yeah. Um, so if, you're, if you don't know Traver, I'm just going to, we're going to have to drudge up some old stuff. So sure. you, you no longer are owner, right? Right. Like, and uh, in a parallel way, I also, you know, I left the gym that I spent most of my professional life in and left that to open up my own gym. Neither of us now are owners, so it's right. it's crazy. It's crazy looking back at that. Full circle. Um, yeah. Could you looking back? Could you look? Could you tell? Could you talk to what led to the rise and ultimately separation from your gym? You, per, you personally. Sure. The rise was um, I. I had no plans to open a gym either. Yeah. I had no plans to be a trainer, and in acupuncture school, uh, two things happened. One, I had a woman who who said she wanted to lose weight. And would uh, ask if I would train her. Mm -hmm. And at the time, like this is this goes back to my nutrition knowledge. At the time, I was eating like uh, Trader Joe's, uh, those like rice noodle <laughs> ramen things. Yeah. You know, it's or, only yeah, it's carbs. Going to Cro uh, going to Costco and buying yeah. like a twenty four pack of chicken and just eating chicken. Yeah, uh, she's like, I will cook for you. She was a brilliant chef and also an acupuncturist. And she's like, you eat like shit. Mm -hmm. I can't believe you're a fucking professional athlete. You know what's fair? Yeah, okay. yeah. We're, I can't believe you're a professional athlete. You eat no vegetables. Yes. Uh, like, well, I'm ripped. Yeah, exactly. Oh, obviously, everything's working. Yeah. So she would bring me food, and in exchange, I would train her. So that was part one. And I was like, oh, I'm watching her body change. I'm watching her life change. And I really don't even know what I'm doing at this point. But there was that. So point A. Point mm -hmm. B, in my last year of school... I had this patient, so we're an, I'm an intern in acupuncture school, mm -hmm. and we get patients that we are we get to see every week. And this woman comes in and says, uh, "I'm here to have you help me lose weight." I'm like, okay, cool. Let's do this. Yeah. Let's uh, let's work design a little workout program. I want you to walk to the end of your street and back every day, okay. and then twice a day, etc. And yeah. like write down everything that you eat for the next week and bring it in, and I'll just take a look at it, and and like spent maybe 30 minutes it's <clears throat> a little more in depth than that mm -hmm. i was like this is how you're gonna do it yeah and at the end of that conversation sitting in the room she says you know i gotta be honest uh i'm not gonna do any of that if you could just put the needles in the right places to make me lose weight that would be great oh. i was like oh okay here oh. i am dedicating four years of my life right. full time to this study yeah and people don't need needles. Right. They don't need herbs. So, yes, people do. But the vast majority of the human population needs to move well yep. and eat well and take care of themselves. And I asked her, like, why? Wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. I didn't ask her anything. At the end of that, she added, um, nutrition isn't a big deal for me. I had two Big Macs last night. She said is or is not? Is not. Okay. I, have two I had two Big Macs last night. Because they sent me a coupon, and I, that like it was like, literally like a lightning bolt of yeah. holy shit! For most people, a coupon is enough impetus to kill themselves with food. Yes, just something showing up in the mail. My energy and time and life force is far better served teaching people how to move, yeah. inspiring them to to do everything I've seen at Andy's in the last two years. Yeah. All those body changes. All those health changes, yeah. what I saw even in myself, like that's a much better way to go than sticking needles in people. Not that I didn't keep doing it or, yeah. or see value in it, but for the masses. Yeah. I was like, how do I, my goal in life that I didn't even know was to affect as many people as possible. Yeah. And I was like, I can do that. I can affect 300 people, 500 people, 1,000 people with a gym, or I can see one patient an hour for how many hours a day. Awesome. So when do you remember what year that was? Yes, two thousand nine. I opened the gym. No, but do you remember? Uh, oh, so you were in acupuncture school when these light bulbs started going. Two thousand eight was okay. when I graduated at the end of two thousand eight. Yeah. And then literally two months later, I was in Santa Barbara 
breaking ground on a gym. Crazy, dude. Yeah. Crazy. I, Because I remember um, at the same time, very few people at nursing school knew what I was thinking in my head, but all of them could see, all of them told me later on that they weren't surprised that I became a trainer mm -hmm. you know, afterwards because they could see that I was really into it. And, you know, long story short, I ended up training two friends the, the who I consider my first client ever. Her name's Marge. Like Marge, I don't know if you're listening, but I miss you. She <laughs> bugged me. She bugged me every week to train her. <clears throat> and I think at this point, I had lost faith in essentially people because so many of my friends and family would ask me to create programs for them. Yeah. And, and whatever. And I would do. I would take hours. You know, you just right. put so much energy into creating things for them. And I would. And they didn't do. And it. And they didn't do it. Yeah. And it happened over and over again. So I think yeah. at some point I was like fuck you guys you know what I mean right and so but Marge kept just kept coming after so I, I eventually reneged and I said okay I will train you but you have to do everything I say literally mm -hmm. everything I say mm -hmm. and she wanted to lose weight and I said actually a lot of that's going to be your diet I'm already like, just looking at her I'm like I could tell I will help you but you have to do everything I say fuck up once and I am done with you that's what I said <laughs> you know what I mean? fuck up once I'm done with you I'm basically re I'm, I'm banking all my hopes yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. of humanity on you so yeah. and I didn't start off with paleo or anything I didn't right. start off with making the right choices I, I went straight to weighing and measuring in the zone right, you know right, right, right. and I didn't teach her any exercise or anything like that and then I, I it's as if I blinked once and opened my eyes and yeah. she lost 65 pounds it was yeah. amazing yeah, yeah yeah and so she she I, th I would say she restored my hope and she restored my faith and people around the school were like marge what did you do and yeah. she just said zeb help me you right, know right, right. she couldn't explain the zone to them but so right. from that 20 people came up to me wanting to the, the same thing and that's where i'm like okay this is a thing this is real and then but all those 20 people only two stuck around, one yeah. guy and one girl. Yeah, uh, Oliver Suba and Angelica Vega, and yeah. I would train them in the school's gym once or twice a week for free. Right, right. you know, and right. uh, and it, it was really cool. It was really really fun, and I think at that point, that's when I started realizing, like, oh, this is real. And I I think I remember you already starting to make moves to leave, and I remember an email you wrote me because I could I was asked to be a trainer. Yeah, uh, by David and. I, I remember emailing you just telling you how scared I was, right. how so scared I was because I was afraid that I didn't know everything I was supposed to know. Yeah, I didn't have the experience, you know, and I remember the thing you told me, the, there was one of the funniest things ever, you know, because you expect like sage like advice and, and wisdom and it was, but it was so, what you said was, Zeb, there are a lot of shitty people out there who are shitty at their jobs and they charge a lot of money yeah. and people pay. Yeah. And they, and I'm just I, I had not are, looked at it so less proficient than you already were at that time. Yeah, I was yeah. so yeah, and and I was I knew I I, I first of all I laughed because that shit was fun. I never looked at it from that standpoint on right. how how it's not it's not a it's not unfair of the market to reward them. It was rewarding action. It was right. rewarding you know yeah, action yeah, takers yeah. and doers. Yeah, a lesson that I wouldn't learn until like ten years later, but. Still, that gave me enough to be like, you know what? I'm gonna throw my hat in the ring for this and yeah. just go for it. And yeah, man. So you you were actually responsible for a lot of me making the right decisions at the right time. I love it. You know, which was I so cool. It. You know, I'll, I'll add because something that for people listening to this about making big jumps. Mm -hmm. You know, I jumped from four years of grad school, sixty thousand dollars in school loans, oh, my man. entire life being going one way. Yeah, and then. Graduating and two months later opening a gym. Yes. Uh, a big part of that decision process too was I have to do something now with my personality. Okay. I have to do something with my voice. I have to do something with this desire to write and speak and affect people. Yeah. Chinese medicine was so quiet. It yes. was so yin mm -hmm. for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. It was so secluded that I knew I needed the yang as yeah. aspect. Yeah. Otherwise, I wouldn't survive even as an acupuncturist. Really quickly, could you explain sure. the yin yang thing to people who, sure, who, sure, aren't, sure. who aren't familiar with it? So, so yin is the feminine. Okay. It's quiet. Yeah. It is subdued. Yeah. It's just a natural. I'm not saying this feminine as in female. Of course. It's just the energetics. Yes. Yang is the explosive. It's the masculine. It's the upward. Mm -hmm. Right. And I had gone from professional fighting, which was this extraordinary outlet. For all yang, yeah. it's all fucking yang. It's yeah. just all hurt, the time. hurt, explode. Yes, nothing quiet, nothing slow. It's just it's you know ma masculine, etc. 
And then that went away. Yeah. And I was left with acupuncture. Yeah. I was like, I will not survive in this field unless I have an outlet for this other extension or this other expression rather. And so that was also a big impetus in opening the gym. And so for people that are listening to this, when you have a strong desire to express, it has to come out. Okay. It literally has to come out. Yes. Otherwise, it will find cracks in your life and come out either shadow ways mm-hmm. or you will implode. Interesting. You will have addiction. You will have to keep that expression pushed down. And usually people push it down with either dissociation or some way that numbs them so they don't have to remember. Like if you're a writer, yeah. you got to write. You have to write. Yeah. If you're a speaker, you got to speak. Yeah. If you're a trainer, you got to coach people. Yeah. Like you said, you were doing it for free. Yes. You were just like, hey, I can't not do this. Yeah. Uh, so that was also a big point of it. And I hope people take away that shit, who you are and how you express better fucking come out or yeah. it's going to come out another way. And yeah, you know, I, I like that. Um, I remember feeling so guilty coming home and I would have so many... N- nursing textbooks Mm -hmm. that I knew I had to read and then back then the CrossFit Journal published one article a month right? and it was like this tall even though I could sit there for hours and do it and I would always choose that I would always choose yeah and one one time the session with um, Oliver you know I told him it would be one hour sessions Mm -hmm. but usually it would go into like 90 minutes because I didn't know time management but we once (laughs) yeah we once spent eight hours like we we trained and then we just sat there and talked about it. And I, in yeah. the back of my head, I knew I had to study for this and study right, for that. Right, right. But it felt this felt so natural to me and so uh, so easy. And yeah. so it it was easy to fall into it and in a, not in an unhealthy way. Right. You know. And but I think you know at the time you don't know who you are. You're you're trying to you're trying to live somebody else's exactly you know, life. And it was looking back, we can see how unhealthy it was. But we, you know, it, we didn't know what we were doing. And of course, now it's like the happiest I've ever been was. And is when I'm hanging out with people that I get to express those avenues. I do like to write. I right. do enjoy right, 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 reading. Right. I do enjoy uh, the speaking thing. I'm. I feel. I feel like I'm still. I think the podcast is just the first step into it. But yeah. it's. It's fun. You know. I like yeah. it. And and the coaching thing. It's come so naturally. All this stuff. The things that I'm doing now. I. I was just. I had to get over the other, other baggage and and illogical fears of techno of technology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. And and reaching out. And embracing the internet instead of rejecting it, yeah. or embracing the future that it represents versus trying to hold on to, you know, old ways in all in all of its forms. Right. You know, you want to actually take the best from the past and discard the rest. Yeah. You know, and and see the best of what the future can bring instead of the worst. Yeah. But yeah, I, I'm. I didn't know that that was your scholastic pursuit as well because I graduated nursing school and just yeah left away, it. Right? You know, I didn't know that you had done essentially. The same, th- the, the exact same thing. Same thing. Yeah, because yeah, I, I had patients. Yeah, and I opened a practice up there. Yeah, but it was like practice was twenty percent, gym was eighty percent. That makes sense. And expression, man, like yeah. that's something that people we don't talk about as Americans. Uh, we don't talk about as men, mm-hmm. but it is extraordinarily important. Yeah, I had a teacher in acupuncture school that said the root of all disease is unexpressed desire. Okay, and I was like, huh, okay, let me chew on that for a couple of years. Yeah. And I did, and then changed it myself to say the root of all dis-ease, no matter what that is, either disease or anxiety, depression, et cetera, is uh, unexpressed expression, hmm. for lack of a better... I know I'm using the same word twice, yeah. but whatever, you, whatever your natural inclination is has to fucking come out into the world. Yes. If it doesn't, if you're an artist, you got to be an artist. Yeah. If you're a painter, you have to be a painter. If you're a healer, you have to be a healer. If you're a writer, whatever it is, it better fucking come out. We work with people who are not in great points in their lives. Yeah. 99% of the time, it's because they have some story that's telling themselves this thing that I want to do, yeah. this person that I want to be, yeah. this way I want to express, I can't because here's the story. Right. Because my parents said I needed to be a doctor. Right. Because I need to make this much money. Because I'm afraid if I, do, if I actually pursue these dreams, I may fail. Etc. But that fucking expression, man, that has to come out. the The story is bullshit. The, the story if, is if bullshit. You, yeah, the story is bullshit. The story that you think is holding you back is bullshit. And I, I it's isn't this something you wish you had known ten years ago? Yeah. Like where we would be now? Oh, and like, I'll, you know, obviously not taking away from the fact that we had to go through that to of learn course, this and blah blah blah. But course. but if you're listening and you're in a spot where you don't feel fulfilled or there's there's something you want to do, launch a website, write a book, 
start a podcast, you know, right. like all, all these things, start a YouTube, you, you got to do it and you got to do it now in the now. sense, yeah, in the sense that don't wait for things to be perfect. They will never, never will be. And that is the curse of the, dare I say, employee. That is, right. the, that is the curse of the robot, right? you know, because you want everything to be perfect. You want the iPhone X without, without releasing the iPhone one. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, you want all that you want to minds are just fucking blown exactly yeah. you you want to launch the rocket into space right. that will have no mistakes right. without launching the other rockets where it's going to fuck up right yeah. i watch um you know like it's and the more the more i delve into this world into the world of entrepreneurship sales business mm -hmm. so much of it rewards action it doesn't re it doesn't necessarily reward victory in fact it you learn more from fucking up yeah absolutely and it sucks man because so much of them know that that they'll learn more from their mistakes. Therefore, in their life, they actually make more mistakes than they, than they win. And right. this is true of any winner. Right. That's the thing. But people only see the wins, and therefore, right. that's right. that's all they think. Right. And I I watch. Um, uh, I have I have really great friends. They hook me up with stuff. So it's like I'm I'm watching Netflix. I'm watching like Hulu stuff. So on Netflix, one of the things I watch is like Planet Earth and The Hunt, like uh -huh. just straight up animal shows. Yeah. And The Hunt is obviously based on on predators, like yeah. and how they how they how they you know chase down and acquire their prey which is first of all amazing every single one of them has found ways around their environment right. blah 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 but the but the truth is <clears throat> almost their num their win numbers or their closing rates or whatever mm. one out of 10 or at best right. 5 to 6 out of 10 they lose 40 to 90% of the time right isn't that isn't that something yeah. the best in the like the top in their environment the top in their ecosystem they lose 90% of the time and you and there's like you watch them you they do everything perfectly and they'll miss Still, one yeah. yeah one one misstep one or miss, luck or yeah, whatever yeah. yeah they don't sit around and feel sorry for themselves no. or whatever they literally move on to the next one and yeah. it's it's insane to watch when you, when you start putting to, together it's like okay you know and so many of my friends have been raised or are stuck in the perfectionistic you know overthinking environment right. and right. it's been such a joy for me personally to slowly break out of that I sat on I sat on making videos for I, I'm I'm not afraid to admit it I've always wanted to do the one minute one take stuff yeah but I was just I just wanted it to be perfect yeah you know what I mean yeah, and yeah. here and here I was almost eight nine years later and right. finally I'm doing it right. and the truth is you you get better with each one you know um, so it's it's good that I'm I'm so glad that that message is out there because when I wrote this outline back in was it December when I saw you yeah your movement. Man Uncivilized was not then what it is now. Like no. the the acceleration has been so fast. Yeah, and I want to I want to actually spend more time on that now sure. because I see the I see the hole in the collective conscious of our country, and I see the hole in in our politics and and even in our in our everyday parlance. Yeah, the hole is there, and it's and it's painful, and it's gaping, and I see you as the ideal person in a unique time uniquely qualified to fill this hole but i feel like we both know i can't go there until we talk about what led you to man uncivilized sure you know and and that means we're gonna have to go into stuff sure 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 you know because yeah i'm an open book okay so because um before before the man uncivilized movement there was a book a book that was called today, today i rise today i rise yeah. and the book is about recovering from divorce the yeah. heartbreak of loss yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and I was in a, I don't think I even said that, but Tra uh, Traver lost, essentially was severed from his gym and his wife within a, a 24, 48 hour period for yeah. all intents and purposes. It's essentially, if you're a man, like lost everything. And uh, I could see from my, because at this, around the same time I had lost my gym, so we were both just like, <laughs> but I could, <laughs> I could see how much worse that could be on his end, you know? Uh, I had lost relationships and I had made huge mistakes and I had every intent of rectifying them. But I could not imagine that on top of losing your life partner, who I I, I myself kind of saw some, some of that courtship. Yeah. And so I've been to your house. I you know met her. I thought you yeah. guys were great. I went to your wedding. Like I yeah. thought it was great, you know. And so that was, as a friend, it's always hard to watch, but I was all, but it was very hard to empath to it was hard for me as a friend to watch because I, I could sense and feel the pain that you were going through knowing how strong of a person you were. Yeah. You know, so thank you. Yeah, man. Um, I, I originally wanted to take a quote from that to lead off, but, I, but I think this new, this new idea will, 
will be better. Sure. But what I, my next question is, looking back, what led to the rise and ultimately fall of your marriage? Ooh. Yeah. I mean, the rise... I don't know how to say what led to the rise is that... You know what? What led to the rise, I, this is probably a profound way to say it, yeah. is my own insecurity. Okay. Because my ex-wife, who I am now divorced from, when we were dating... She broke up with me a number of times yeah. and even said, like, I don't really have feelings for you. Okay. And then would circle back around. And she was this push-pull, push-pull. And had I been in my own sense of power, yes. I would have said, awesome, best of luck to you. God bless, move on. Sure. But I didn't. I had somehow tied my own self-identity and my own okayness in the world to being with her. Yeah. So think about it that way. I wasn't okay without her. So uh -huh. I was okay waiting for her to come back around as opposed to saying, yeah, I'm strong, I'm powerful, I'm a man, I know what I'm doing, I have mission, I have purpose, I have integrity, I'm grounded, boom. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be around on this amazing journey that I'm taking someone on? God bless you. Right. I can't wait to find out who's going to be. Sure. It wasn't that. No. It was the opposite. So that, and I was in love with her. Yeah. Uh, just truthfully. I was in love with her and... That's colored with, I was in love with the idea of her. Yeah. I was in love with the idea of us together. Yeah. More than the reality of us together. Oh, that's rough. So it's it We've was all been there. Yeah, it's yeah. a multifaceted uh, mind fuck of a lot of factors. So the, that's how we got together. Um, I would joke with her that like I was the last man standing in her life. That she would date other people and then come back to me. Yeah. Date other people, come back to me. And looking back, it's horrifying. Sure. I look at myself at the time and be like, holy fuck, man. Someone shake you awake. Yes. And like, stand up for your goddamn self. Yeah. But I wasn't that person then, to be quite honest. And so the demise of it is also, again, a confluence of factors in that I had to react to... This is what I can just speak for myself. Yeah. Uh, I was in a relationship with someone. I was married to someone who on a very visceral level, I didn't feel was in love with me. Wow. Yeah. Because I didn't get the day-to-day -day cues. Okay. It wasn't like, hey, this little thing you do, like, you know the way you make breakfast? I fucking love that. Okay. Never heard that. There was a lot of the opposite. Yeah. Which is, you know, like you get up really early. You do these things that I, like, I'm not that stoked on. Uh -huh. uh, when you kiss me, you're, you're like beard irritates me oh. and there was more of that than there was the man I just love being around you you're fascinating you're inspiring right. you're yada yada right. and to her defense for lack of a better term there were things that were really integrated and inspiring about who I was at the time but there was also a whole bunch of shit that wasn't okay right I was smoking dope yeah. every single day yeah I was out of control with opening too many businesses yeah overwhelmed to too much shit going on not sleeping so I'm this this overwhelmed zombie no boundaries taking on anything and everything that could possibly come my way yeah human uh, which made me hard to be around yeah which made me um, like difficult and it just, it didn't make me a leader. Like okay. she, I will give her this, couldn't trust me because I was going 50 different directions at the same time. Right. You, right. You were not worthy. You were not trustworthy. No, I wasn't. I truthfully wasn't because the most common sentence I think I said to her was just give it a couple more months and this will change. Just let the gym hit this number of members and this will change. Just let me make this much money and this will change. And those things would all fall in line eventually and there'd be something new that I would say, no, 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 just wait until this thing happens. You know, then we'll be in the clear, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So I had no sense of direction. I had no sense of wow. real leadership within the relationship right. because I'd entered the relationship under the guise of, holy shit, she's going to leave at any point oh. because she's already left multiple times. Yeah. So my job now is just to make sure she doesn't leave. To prevent another escape. To tip, exactly. Oh, and what do you know? Man. Uh, one day I woke up and we'd had a great couple months together. We hung out and played with the dog. We yeah. ate breakfast. I asked what she was doing and boom. She said, I'm leaving you. I'll be gone within the hour. My God. Boom. Done. Like worst fear. Yeah. Actualized. So what was led to the demise? 
I don't think she was ever in it for the right reasons. Okay. Uh, I think she was in love with the idea of being married. Yeah. She had come off of a relationship trauma, and there I was standing who was, yeah, I'll just keep sticking around. Yeah. It's like, shit, this guy's reliable in that sense. Yeah. But never was, man, she, I think she wanted to be married more than she wanted to be married to me. Yes. And I felt that. Yeah. And so, one, I had my own challenges. Yeah. I had my own problems. And then I reacted negatively to that. Yeah. So as opposed to being actualized and empowered and saying, hey, something's not really working. I'm not feeling this in the way I want to. Let's have an open-ended conversation. Let's have a really open, intimate conversation. Mm -hmm. I would say, let's talk about nothing. Sure. Because I believe at the end of every conversation, if it goes deep enough, is going to be, I'm leaving. Yeah. Which is a fucking terrible That's way to terrible. it's terrible. It's, a, terrible. it's like an actual recipe for marital nuclear sure. disaster. Especially with the law of you go to where you're you go to where you focus. Exactly. And if you're focused on Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know, I was sure that at some point she was gonna leave. And I felt that in my gut. Oh, and man. one that was the reference. Mm -hmm. Like people who want to be around you find reasons to be around you. Yes. People who want to be elsewhere find reasons to be elsewhere. Yeah. And she was elsewhere a lot physically. She was elsewhere a lot emotionally. And I could feel all you of that. You could feel it. Yeah. You were, were, you, were you in denial? Knowing that you felt it. Like knowing now that you, this is, you could perceive that she was elsewhere. Absolutely. I was in denial from the collarbone up. Yeah. In that I tell myself like, well, we're married, we're, right. we're, we're we have a house, we have a dog, we're gonna we got pregnant, like right. everything's going as on track. From the collarbone down, from my stomach, I think I was like, holy oh. fuck, this right. is not good. Right. Let me get high. Yeah. Let me drink. Let me take on another business. Let yeah. me take on another project, because if I'm focused on that, if I feel nothing, I don't have to feel this, I see. which is true. I don't have to feel the truth. Right. Oh Whew. man! Shit on a shingle, huh? Dude, it's like I remember when I remember this one thing you told me, and if we're just gonna go there, right? Like I'm mm -hmm. just gonna. Yeah. I remember this one thing you told me that you said, Zeb, I wanted to be with her more than I wanted a healthy marriage. Yeah. And I absolutely. was like, oh shit. Yeah. So, ladies, first of all, if you meet a guy, if you meet a guy like that, he's for real. You know, maybe unhealthy. Yeah. But codependent might... as fuck. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's about her, not the situation. Yeah. And it's not about me. Sure. I, w I'd, I would literally have said I'd rather be with her than be healthy yeah. myself. Yeah. And that was just the point I was at in my life from my own family of origin issues, the own insecurities I brought in, and that natural confluence of, man, this girl's hurt me so many times before we even got married. Yeah. Uh, I know she's going to do it again. Yeah. And still, and still you did it. Yeah. Yeah. So the, for the, but it seems like both of you entered into it with for the wrong reasons. Yeah, for sure. And you were both not for all intents and purposes, not ready. Because there's lots of people out there who say you can never be ready. You know, but mm. but I feel like there certainly has to be a framework for the future and a level of compatibility and chemistry that must that must be aligned before entering into a lifelong agreement like that. For sure, there really wasn't there weren't conversations. I remember Zeb because we dated a couple times, yeah, on and off through school and after school. That when she moved up to Santa Barbara, I remember telling Eric, my uh, ex business partner, I was like, if we, she and I start dating, we're off to the races mm -hmm. because we already have four years of history together. You've already laid the groundwork. Yeah, yeah. she's my fr I've, like she was my study partner, so I've spent hours and hours and hours and hours with this woman. Oh, well, that's right. You she yeah. went to oh, okay. she went to school. She went to me. acupuncture school. So we're not going to go out on a date and go. So tell me about you. Right. Right, like I knew her, so we moved in together quite quickly, yeah. got engaged quite quickly, uh, and I think had that period been traditional dating, yeah, I would have said, "Huh, at this point in traditional dating, usually one of us feels this or that, yeah. and we don't. Let's talk about that." Yeah, and we just didn't. It was like poof, oh, off man. to the races. Because you know, I will say that I remember exactly when I knew she was your girl. It didn't mean that it was going to work, given my own you know, the lack of experience here with long-term stuff. But I remember, I'm not going to bring up any names, but I remember you had called me up one day. I was still roommates with Mike Hain. Mm -hmm. and hey, Mike. What's up, Mike? He, he listens, by the way, too. So I remember when I was I was roommates with him and we were you had called me on the phone because she had pulled some 
it, it didn't necessarily it wasn't her fault yeah but she had chosen to attend an event yeah you know with someone else and an event that you were also might yeah, have yeah. been involved in right and i could tell i could see how messed up you were ladies man that you are and I, i'm like Traver's not this messed up about anybody right and especially when it gets to a certain point there is a there is a point in a situation that that is a losing situation where in the in in, in good taste and decency and self-preservation it's like okay well that's it. I'm cutting my losses. On to the next one. But you stuck right, with it. Right. You stuck with it emotionally, and I could I could see that you were just messed up about it. And in my head, I'm like, this is his girl. Yeah. This is his girl. He's not going to invest this much into any girl. He's not going to invest this much into a, even a girlfriend. But man, only invest this much into something that he thinks will be it. Like mm-hmm. he thinks it'll be the one. I remember that. I remember that day to myself. So I wasn't surprised when you guys announced your marriage. But I also had a lot to learn about what it takes to make something last because acquiring a thing and yeah, maintaining yeah, a yeah. thing are very completely different completely different yeah I'm learning that now you know like acquiring freedom is not the same as keeping freedom right right and right. so <clears throat> there's so, there's even a principle that, that hit me in it like a ton of bricks uh, that I don't I'm not going to articulate right and I don't know the names of it but it's like you have a different experience desiring something mm-hmm. than you do once you have it so yeah. people often trance like god I really want this TV I really really want this TV right then they think that that energy will stay the same yeah. when they get the TV. And not to say that uh, another relationship's a material object. Sure. But this transfer is the same in relationship. Yes. Like the pursuit gives you one feeling. And when, you have, when, you're, when you're in that relationship, yeah. a part of your brain's like, but wait a minute. I felt this way mm-hmm. back then. I don't feel that way now. I don't know how to, to, how to uh, reconcile, reconcile yeah. those two. Oh man, right. yeah, this is tr- it's true. The pursuit of a thing is not the same, even energetically, as exactly. the acquisition of the thing, right? And, and the, main- the, the maintenance, maintenance of the of thing. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, <clears throat> uh, I, I feel like I've been lucky because I'm as you were as you were saying that I start I started thinking back on my life about n- not relationships but things that I have wanted for so long that I worked towards for so long, and I count myself lucky in that the things that I have wanted that I've worked so long for are in fact what I thought they would be because right. to, to, to your point usually when a person is attracted to another person we project onto that person what we see as their ideal right we project onto them um, essentially a perfect person which they right, can right, which they right, can't right, match right. you know right. and so and people do it to us you know but mm-hmm. but I the what I've got right now is essentially my mind is being blown right now I'm, I'm still chasing to articulate it but when I wanted freedom and freedom to me means when I was growing up uh, I very much felt uh, caged in this doesn't mean my parents didn't love me and it didn't mean that it was the worst of all kind of upbringings I had a very good upbringing you know yeah. my, my parents were good to me um, but it, you know it was based on a tr- very traditional system mm-hmm. a system that is not geared towards pioneering and freedom right, right. and so right. Uh, the idea that I, there was a world that I could make my own decisions and be accountable for the consequences of those decisions by myself and just have that as mine was yeah. so was so delicious to me. Yeah. And so <clears throat> I, I hungered for that for so long and I would literally sit in my room for hours and just like dream of it, you know? And mm. so when I finally moved out, even though the even though the the it was for all intents and purposes very austere I loved it so much. Like I remember one of the, my most favorite days ever was that I ca- got I came home from work and I laid down on my bed and there was old school popcorn on the ceiling like this, <laughs> popcorn ceilings. And I remember I laid down on my bed and I stared at the popcorn on the ceiling for four straight hours wow. in complete silence. No one called my name. Right. I wasn't accountable to anybody. Right. I had I had done an honest day's work and in, in, engaged in a pursuit that I loved and it was the greatest shit ever. Yeah. I that was 2001 I think and it's wow. now to the 17 years later I still feel the same. Right. So so freedom was good like I remember I used to live in the San Fernando Valley. I still have lots of friends there, lots of people who I love who live there. But I always wanted to move here, right. you know, like near to the near the beach and I wanted that I waited 12 years Trevor, to like yeah. fucking just get and so I remember it was so bad. I when I first moved here, it took me a good 3 to 4 months for my self-esteem to catch up to, <laughs> to like the acquisition because you know you're stuck in a place for so long right you know you're stuck in a in a state of wanting and working for for so long yeah i remember three or four months when i was here i was just wait do i really 
deserve to be here. It, right. it was fucking with my like my self esteem, right. you know, because when it's like when people are are leaving a an abusive relationship or a bad relationship, yeah, a part of them wants to escape back to it because it's comfortable, it's familiar, it's familiar, yeah, and and what they want and unexplored territory is unfamiliar, right? So. But you know, so it took me time to get used to the facts. Like, oh, I I do live near the beach. I can go to the water whenever I want. Right. You know, where that I can go to any any place around here at untold hours of the night and just chill. Like that was that was not a thing back where I used to live. Yeah. And so yes, I will I will say as far as those pursuits, I have been lucky in that the uh, the pursuit and the acquisition, have, the uh, expectations of both were met. Have matched. Yeah. However. You know, as you know from my from like for in the areas of dating and romance, it is not, and that's yeah. com- that's obviously mine. That's like I take complete responsibility for that. <laughs> right, you know? right, right, but right, right. yeah, and and I would I'm, I would be lying to say that so much of my podcast and the people that I have on board, I almost always want to choose. Um, first of all, people that I can learn from, but second, there is, I know that there are every guest of mine can reach people that I myself can't reach just mm. because of the differences, mm-hmm. but also. I want people who can who are who I see as juggling the demands of a professional life at the highest level of competence with a family life. Right. You know, and I would be lying to say that I am aware that I'm aware that I'm not 17 anymore, mm-hmm. 20 anymore. So, yes, hard lessons are best are the best lessons, but there is also the factor of time. Mm-hmm. And so I would be lying to say that I didn't I'm not taking notes on your on what you've learned and mm. what you should and should not do you know and and looking at patterns and stuff like that right, right, you know because right. i know and it's happened a few times but i know you know i feel like someday i'm gonna i'm so good right now like zeb the zeb pasquale show is the <laughs> fucking awesome right everything is set my ducks in are in a row i wake yeah. up in the morning and the road is fucking clear and yeah, there's no yeah. there's no one around i'm in the end zone no one's around right and so but i know all it takes man to man you're gonna meet one girl who's gonna yeah. fuck up your program. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And it's happened to all of us. God bless them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so, I I feel like I just want to be ready. Like in in that sense, you know, yeah. I'm not I'm not necessarily looking for it, but it has happened and it knocked on my feet. Yeah. Every every standard that you've set for yourself, every thing to not be made an exception, is being broken or being made ex, you know as an exception. So yeah. Um, I want you know th- that was the. That was the, what I wanted to lead into was sure I'm I'm an officiant I officiate weddings it's, yeah. it's a huge honor and kind of funny because yeah. of all the people that they could have chosen yeah. to officiate a fucking wedding a lifetime commitment to another person they choose me it was fine right but uh, I've seen I've seen two divorces mm-hmm. and the, it's always terrible and there's nothing there wasn't anything about those divorces but I've seen two friends divorce I've seen lots of my family members divorce mm-hmm. but. There wasn't anything about the divorces of my friends that could not be traced back to holes that weren't addressed and precedents that weren't that weren't set and self awareness work that wasn't done pre wedding mm-hmm. pre marriage mm-hmm. you know because so much of the marriage themselves marriages themselves were built on faulty assumptions and lies yeah you know and listening to your <clears throat> listening to your story it's it makes me sad but would you agree with that yeah definitely. There were there were so many conversations that just never happened. Yeah. On either of our end. Yeah. Of that stuff she didn't like to and saw out of me and stuff that I didn't like and saw out of her. Yeah. And we neither nothing was talked about. Yeah. Right? And then that tiny resentment builds. It's like you said, a, a hole that's there pre marriage or pre, you know, fully commitment or pre baby, pre kid, mm-hmm. the whole thing expands. Your whole life and relationship expands, and those holes expand in size too. Yeah, and they end up being deal breakers. Yeah. So yeah, and your own. So I'll, to to add to this, like my own sense of self. Yeah. Or my own <clears throat> lack of sense of self, or lack of understanding, or lack of consciousness, especially around what you just said. When someone comes and takes you and knocks all of your rules away. Yeah. You're fucked. Yes. And one of the things I actually would tell her is I broke all of my rules for you. Yeah. Not knowing that that was a bigger red flag for me than for anybody else. So the idea of now consciously relating, the idea of entering into a relationship consciously is to say, I actually don't break those rules. Yeah. And if you're the type of person 
that wants me or needs me to break those rules to be with you, not even wants, just mm-hmm. needs, mm-hmm. then you're not the right person. Right. No matter how much I may think you may be the right person or how much stuff I'm projecting on you, like that's the actual conscious barrier to entry. Okay. That's the new paradigm of this. That's how I teach relationship or teach men about relationship is you're going to want to break that rule. Don't. A hundred double down on not breaking that rule, yeah, because that does set the precedence, yes, and it sets the precedence for you. Mm -hmm. And if that rule is breakable, you actually have more work to do before you should get into a relationship with that person. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I want I want to stay here a little longer because um, I'm a I'm a only now like I'm a huge libertarian at heart, philosophically more so, um, but I'm also. I'm a big Anne Rand fan. Okay. And a lot of my friends disagree with a lot of the stuff that she's, but it's, it relates, I, I, it resonates with me. And one of the, her books that I really like is called The Fountainhead. Okay. I don't know if you've ever read it. No, I read Atlas Shrugged and I wanted to like it was, hang myself yeah, by yeah. about page 50. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, oh, well, you repeated the first 50 pages. Exactly. 200 times. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's a reason why Atlas Shrugged is not on, <laughs> on my list, but Fountainhead is. So Fuck. yeah, i I remember I, I read Fountainhead when I was a kid and okay. At the time, I didn't know, like, I, I knew then that I wasn't in a place where I could understand it. Right. So I read it again, like, 10 years later, and then, and I think I read it at a time in my life when I was torn on what to do after I graduated nursing school. So it actually did, it was instrumental in me choosing CrossFit. Okay. You know, because all the temptations that this, the main character has to, but to, to have him stray away from his main goal and his main, you know, professional pursuit, he never took. Okay. So essentially, it was, it was a, it was a plea to... Uh, it was it was a plea to to find out who you are as a person and realize that in the outside world that was the thing with mm-hmm. essentially no compromise mm-hmm. and so of course there's a love story attached to it <clears throat> but when they were examining it's maybe honestly like text wise it's almost a third the size of Atlas Shrugged so fear okay. not yeah <laughs> but one of the things they were talking about was the, was the nature of love and how right. I think it was assumed that if you have one if you have one person and another person who are self aware confident. I'm not going to say fully formed because I think we're always growing, right, but fully formed in the moment. Right. When they love, when they realize that they love somebody, love very much is in fact the art of exception making. And mm. the way I interpreted that was, there are rules, there are rules for being single. And what I mean is, the rules single Traver operates under mm-hmm. may or may not be the same as the rules that married Traver operates under. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure, Mm -hmm. but I do, I have seen from my friends who were single and then in relationships that they, there's give, you know, whereas what, what, you know, what I see is a single person can operate, a single unattached person can operate in the black and white space. Right. And it's, and everything is my way or the highway. Right. There's no need for compromise. Exactly right. Yeah. 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 And whereas in, when you're working with another person, you are accountable to the interests of this person. Yeah. You are accountable to yourself and what you're, the dynamic that you and this person expect Mm -hmm. to happen from this. Mm -hmm. And I, I see that space and that, um, that interwoven navigation as the as the art of exception making if you're dealing with two very strong willed individuals that that's the way I, that's yeah, the way yeah, i interpreted yeah. it yeah. what is your take given that <clears throat> rules are not to be broken on that view well i think you know <clears throat> anytime you have a relationship you have like three separate circles mm-hmm. you've got the circle of you mm-hmm. the circle of your partner and then somewhere up above them is the thir- circle of the relationship okay and that's three separate entities and so the relationship is going to Definitely, there has to be some form of compromise anytime there's a merging of two lives. Yes. What's not compromisable is the value system, and the the code by which someone lives by. So you have like you have deal breakers. You have okay. things to say. Hey, I won't do X. Yes. Period. Fucking period. Even if I love you and you come into my life, mm-hmm. that's where I think uh, yes, there has to be exception made. Yeah. But first, your circle has to be as complete and whole and integrated and integral and into you, you have to have so much integ in integrity yep. in your own circle period mm-hmm. and say to your partner here is my life i'm looking for someone to join it these are the things about it that are never going to change mm-hmm. period i know myself well now i know this if you want someone that's going to have these things change it's i'm not the right person 
And you have to look at that in a way that says, if that happens and that person leaves your life, good. Yeah. Because if they stay, it won't work anyway. Yeah. And so what so many of us do, and I did in relationship, and a lot of people do in relationship, is say, let me let me change who I am for the sake of my partner. Oh, my wow. Just a, even if it's just a little bit. Right. Let me change who I am. Let me not express myself in this way that I need to express myself. And so I say to that, it's like it's like a five dollar fee. Yeah. If I'm like you're like, hey, I don't like the fact that you get up in the morning and you get out of bed before I do and you go work out. Like, hey, that's who I am. Right. But I won't do that for you. Right. Because I really like you and you're cute and you know, like you're great in bed and these yeah. things are good about my relationship. That's like a five dollar charge every time I do that. Yeah. Which for the first three months, <clears throat> it's not bad. It's four hundred and fifty bucks. Sure. Over the course of ten years. Yeah. Uh, you start running out of money. Right. You start. That's where people say, like, "God, I don't even know who I am anymore." Yeah. Because they've given away so much of who they are, and who they who they are at their core. Yes. So, first, you have to know who you are at your core, and you have to then say, "Ah, who I am at my core is incompatible with what you want." Mm-hmm. So you're awesome. High five. God bless you. Kiss on the cheek. Now I need to go find someone else who yeah. is compatible. But most people. I have found in my experience, because they're so desperate for companionship, desperate for intimacy, desperate for sex, desperate for relationship, they say, sure, I'm, oh shit, I'm 30, I gotta get married, yeah. I wanna have kids, so yeah. let me compromise in these ways that then are gonna come back and bite me in the ass yeah. five years later, because it's unsustainable to not be who you are. Yes. That's a huge point. It's like trying to hide the truth forever. Forever. Just it just it doesn't fucking work. Yeah. It doesn't work. So when I look back on my own marriage or own divorce and other couples who I've worked with since, it's like, when did you first sit down and say, hey, wait a minute, this doesn't really work with who I am, mm-hmm. but God, I just, you know, I love fucking you. Sure. So I, wanna, I don't want to stop that. I don't want to go back to being single. Yeah. Everybody in my family has kids. Yeah. I don't. Shit. I gotta be. I can't be the last one standing. Right. Let me compromise. So it's it's a mix, man. It's it's yes, there is there is compromise. Yes, yeah. there is um, enmeshment. Mm-hmm. Yes, there is interdependence. Mm-hmm. But if you don't know who you are, first and foremost, and if you're not willing to stand up for who you are, and honestly say to the person across from you, ah, that doesn't work for me. Yeah. I'm more willing to lose you than I am to bring you into my life and have you leave later yes. or have me have to leave later, right. then you're at you're operating from a place of weakness. I like that. Um, yeah. That makes sense to me. Okay, so now, because I, I, wanted to, I wanted to get into what the differences was, what the differences were definitionally between the, what I saw and what you saw, and I think it's ultimately the same. Yeah. In that the core, it's like the difference between strategy and tactics, yeah. where strategy is the, is the long-term overall goal where tactics is how you execute that goal. Right. And I think with relationships, it's the, the long-term goal, whether it's to the the rearing and raising of children or having a successful family life, I feel like that's that's almost universally the goal. Right. Um, if not just having a, having a great partner in crime. But how you execute those things may or may not be congruent with your may or may not be congruent with what you did and how you how you went about doing things as a single person. Right. But it does not change the strategic overall outcome. Yeah. Like that I'm that's how I like understand things. Yeah, you know? yeah. So we look at <clears throat> again, we go back to this idea of what is conscious relating? Mm-hmm. What is that term? And how is it in action? It's about how you approach your relationship now. Yeah. So if someone out here is listening and is dating, mm-hmm. for most of us, what's the idea of dating? I've seen this girl God, I really want to be with her. Yeah. She's super hot. She's super fun. She's super funny. I really want to be with her. Mm-hmm. That is an unconscious way of entering a relationship yeah. because you're really chasing after the projection. Yeah, you're already projecting you onto already this. You already got it. Yeah. So the new paradigm of consciously entering a relationship is I'm not trying to date you. Mm-hmm. I'm not trying to fuck you because mm-hmm. we're going to take that off the table because that's a massive driver. Yes. All we're going to say is I really want to get to know you and then make an actual decision or a series of decisions along the way 
if you being in my life is going to enhance it or not. Yeah. Period. Yeah. Period fucking period. I like it. And so that's a huge skew. Yeah. It actually throws people off that aren't dating in the same fashion. Yes. When you, I can literally sit across from a woman and say two things. Right now, I don't want to fuck you mm-hmm. and I don't want you to be in my life because I don't know you. Yeah. As opposed to, hey, it's our third date. Uh, technically, I think we should be having sex by sure. now. So why aren't we doing that? Yeah. Right? For men especially, it, it changes the, the power dynamic. Very much. To say, hey, guess what? Uh, you don't get to fuck me mm-hmm. because I don't know you. Yeah. And a lot of guys listening to that probably just went like, holy oh, shit, shit, what did that dude just say? Yeah. Yeah. When you take that attitude on of, yeah. I'm not going to welcome you into my life yeah. and into my sphere and into this awesome, amazing thing that I'm building until I find out whether you're going to be an enhancement or a detraction. I like it. Then you're in the driver's seat, right? He with the most need has the least power. Yes. So when you can look at someone and say, my life's awesome. Yeah. I don't need you to add to it. I'd love for you to add to it if you can. Yeah. If you can't, I'm just going to go, boop, find the next person who sure. can. The, I would go so far as to say that this this is the framework for any relationship. It's 100%. Any relationship. Yeah, business it's relationship. It's not the current model. Yes. It's the transitional model that's coming online right now, mm-hmm. in my opinion. I agree. And maybe subcon because when you look at you look at... You look at great negotiators. You look at great leaders. I, first of all, someone asked me a long time ago, and I straight up stole this. It's like, Zeb, what do you, what is your, what is your, <laughs> yeah, listen, it's like, what do you, <laughs> what is your view on what the perfect date is, or what is a date exactly? I'm like, a date is two things. You are trying to get to know the person, and you are trying to have fun. That is it. Yeah, right. Perfect. And yeah, and I was period. just like, yeah, period. And, awesome. Okay, so so there's that, and then, and then, uh. The I, I was helping somebody, yeah, just yesterday. You know, she, I'm, I'm not going to mention names or companies or anything, mm-hmm. but she's having a hard time with boundary setting. Mm-hmm. You know, professionally, uh, and maybe even personally. But, but I, I could tell as it went on that she had not set boundaries for herself. She had not had the conversation with herself. Right. And that is the that is the most important conversation to have before you talk to anybody. Right. And the the largest thing coming into a negotiation or just any kind of influencing type conversation is leverage and the mm-hmm. ability to walk away but also you want to be able to walk away with a mutual agreement right right a mutual accord whether it's a mutual yes or mutual no you don't want it to be a unilateral yes yeah or yeah, no, yeah, or yeah unilateral no so right yeah and that that's why it's because i just i was just helping a friend of mine with something like this but with prof, with the professional you know work not not mm-hmm. relationship but yeah, it makes so much sense because people are people are animals with intelligence, and right. just like animals, we can smell fear, right. we can smell we can smell love, we can smell hope, we can smell aggression, right. we can smell neutrality, right. you know, we can smell emotional investment, and right. that has that that is not changed when we have person to person interactions. Yeah. That's why so much of communication is ninety percent body language and tonality. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so dude, I I like that. I I was talking to Steve my on my on episode one about it and how. It was Aki mm-hmm. at your wedding mm-hmm. who taught me, Zeb. There are in any marriage there are three people, right? There, yeah, there's Traver, yep. there's her My ex-wife, yeah, yeah, ex-wife, and then there's Traver and ex-wife, right? And so, without, without, uh, I, I didn't know Dick like about any of that. Yeah, and I, my mind was blown. And he goes, "They each have needs. They each right. have desires Absolutely. that must be met. Absolutely, you know. And in in getting together, they've created this." whole other third en- entity yeah third entity yeah. and which itself has its own needs and desires and stuff so yeah, yeah man it was i'm just making a note of where that was yeah so yeah it's, it's like i'm glad that that has not changed because you know it's it was however many years ago and i just i just heard it and me knowing nothing and and am trying to take as much notes as possible you know yeah it's, it's, it's a huge idea yeah Right, so we don't have most of us don't have a good relationship framework, mm-hmm. so we don't know to even think like that. Yes, um, I work with so many guys after the fact who say, "But God, I did everything for her. I made I, I, I made my whole life about her. Yeah, I have no idea why this didn't work. Yeah, it's like you actually abandoned that first circle. Yes, which was you. Right, and so if this if we if that third circle of the relationship is sitting on the foundation 
of the you and the her underneath mm -hmm. it or the you and the him, whatever it is, mm -hmm. and one of those drops out, yeah. then the relationship is really sitting on one. Yes. And it can't it can't work that way. Right. It's an unhealthy deal from the start. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so I want to segue that into... Sure. Uh, you wrote a book. Yeah. Australia, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it your, your first one? Yeah, first one. And... Today I Rise. Today, today, yeah. It's... Can you summarize the purpose of the book? Sure. Uh, purpose of the book is to take anybody who is, you know, it was a guidebook from day one to day 90, <clears throat> although people are reading it years later or extending that out over the course of as much time as they need of, okay, your relationship ended yesterday. Here's what you need to know. Here's what you need to do all the way through like a three month guide. And the guys isn't how do I get from holy fuck I can't believe this happened to okay I'm okay. Yeah. It's how do you get from holy fuck this happened to oh thank God it did. Okay. Because I'm gonna use it as a way to change all of these areas of my life. Would it be a useful read for women as well? Oh, hundred percent. It's okay. not male. I wrote it unisex. Okay. And have specific sections like there's actually just one specific chapter for men and one specific chapter for women, but all the stories flip flop, you know, like yeah. the very first chapter is I polled people and said, what was the one thing you didn't hear during your divorce that you needed to hear over and over? And it was actually what I was so fortunate to hear, which was you'll be okay. Hmm. You're going to be okay. You're, you're going to be okay. Yeah. That was the lifesaver. Yeah. It was people like you, people like my buddy, Tom, people like my buddy, my friends, Drew, Sam and Jim, who would call and say, hey, guess what? You can't see it yet. And you're so deep in the woods that you'll, you, you're, it's no wonder you can't see it, but we see it, you're gonna be okay. Awesome. You're gonna be okay. So just universal, yeah. right? So how do you get someone from, shit, how do I breathe? Mm -hmm. how, literally, I, I don't even know how to breathe right now. Oh, it's, yeah, the, the physiological right? pain is so Boom. real. So real yeah. to, okay, now here's the, the paradigm shift. If pain is the greatest teacher none of us wanna learn from, how do we use it? Okay. How do we how do we turn back and look at pain and say one of the exercises I have people do is write out, literally write out. And I did this this past weekend at a workshop in San Diego and got some incredible answers. Okay. <clears throat> if my pain could speak to me today, it would say boom boom boom. Oh. Finish that sentence. I like that. Right? Where so many of us, especially with heartbreak, which yeah. is the motherfucker of all pains, yes. how do I get rid of this? How do I make it stop? How do I numb it? How do I shut it off? Yeah. Like I want to run 50 miles away from it yeah. as opposed to stop, take a deep breath and go, let's have a dialogue with it. Oh, this pain wants me to know that I will never get in another relationship with someone I don't know is madly in love with me. Okay. Or I won't continue a relationship. Yeah. I will never let myself ignore these three red flags again. Yeah. I will build up a sense of self so great yeah. that I know where I stand that if someone walks out of my life, I have this amazing foundation underneath it yeah. again, whatever it may be. Sure. Uh, people's pains speak differently to them. So yeah, completely unisex. I Okay. So so that's great. Like mm -hmm. knowing that mm -hmm. men and women can read it mm -hmm. with, with equal benefit. Mm -hmm. Can the book be applied to not just the pain of a breakup, but yeah. loss of any kind? Yeah. The, it can. Yeah. One of the more unique aspects of my life is getting messages from people who have lost a family member, mm -hmm. even lost a kid, uh, which is the most, both of those I can't imagine right. fully actualizing uh, or fully having in the physical world. But I get messages saying, hey, you know, I'm not divorced, but my husband died five years ago. Yeah. And I've been in this fog. Yeah. Or even people saying, hey, I got divorced a decade ago. And now I'm just starting to put the, the, the action steps of your book into place. And it's helped so much. Because I was still had these, you know, I call them uh, unpacked boxes. Yeah. Like there's still a box in the middle of your living room. Every time something happens to you, yeah. someone dies, boom, box in the living room. I see. Break up, box in the living room. What do most of us do? Uh, I'm going to drink until I don't see the box. <laughs> right. Right? I'm going to pretend the box isn't there. Sure. I'm just going to say, there's no box. Yeah. But you got to unpack it. Yeah. You got to go through it. You got to look at it. It's full of stories. Yeah. You got to take each story out and go, is that true? Mm -hmm. Or is that, am I making that up? Is that truth? Sure. Right? Or am I making that up? Can I prove this? Is it truth? Oh. Is there another way to look at it? Can I ask someone else, maybe a professional, maybe a coach, hey, this is how I, I see this story. Is that accurate or do you see it another way? Mm -hmm. So when I work with a lot of guys who are getting divorced, I'm like, 
okay, you just said she's the reason that your life fell apart. Yeah. Is that true? Or is that the story you're telling yourself because it happened coincidentally? Mm -hmm. Right? So let's look at real situation from an abject or objective standpoint or a different standpoint and then dissect it. Yeah. I, I it, it just it just brought something to mind and I want to, I want your take on mm -hmm. this because you're right most most men don't have a framework approaching a relationship. I can't speak for women, mm -hmm. right? But I know I know we are not taught what to look for or no. what even makes sense. No. Uh <clears throat> and like I said, I love western civilization, but every choice has its pros and cons. Right. And there's where if if you are within a prison or under rule of a tyrant freedom is great right but in the midst of anarchy freedom is not great right you need some structure you need some responsibility Absolutely. so one of my best friends is muslim okay and he was explaining he was explaining conservative and contemporary um rituals as far as getting married and rearing children mm -hmm. and even the courtship process and it was so wildly different yeah. from the west and i don't know if you have experience but i'm just going to say it now because mm -hmm. i've never um said it but one of the first things he said was there is no dating before marriage. You only get to know each other after you get married. Mm. And if you're raised here, I was so, I didn't even know what to do with it. You know right. what I mean? I, it was as if I was looking at a backwards algebraic equation that had no, like you, I didn't even know what to do. Right. But I, I was so mind blown and so distraught and so mm. confounded. I was like, wait, so how, how do you look? Like how do you even, go? so he starts explaining you know, you cannot, you are not allowed to speak with her. You are not allowed to, you, you can, you're essentially old school. Your parents had to approach their parents mm -hmm. and ask them to describe you and your future. And then they would describe her. And so <clears throat> it was a responsibility of the girl's parents to make sure that the guy there she's marrying into will respect her mm -hmm. and protect her and blah, blah, blah. And the guy's parents' responsibility was to find a good woman and to make sure that he doesn't become a freaking shit bag. You know what I mean? And so... <laughs> I, I was just so, I'm so, I was so mind blown. But one of the things I do like was that there is a framework. Yeah. And there is a framework for what makes a successful, what makes a successful marriage. And not just that, but maybe more a successful acquisition. Because ever since he got married, I haven't fucking seen the guy. Right. Like, you know, no shit. But right. then it was, he goes, certainly from the start, whether you get to know them or not, there must be chemistry and compatibility. Yeah. And there actually wasn't a third factor because I usually operate in threes. But the more I thought about it, I was like, that is that is so true. Mm -hmm. If only those two are present, you know what I mean? Like, if there's chemistry in that she is attracted to him and he's attracted to her, and if there's compatibility, and I see compatibility as encompassing the non-biological attraction type stuff. Mm -hmm. So so future goals, future vision. Right, right, right. And, and even united in that neither marriage nor love comes first, but Allah comes first. Mm. Allah comes first. You know, and so... Given that those two are there, I was like, you know what? I I cannot help but agree, or I I cannot find disagreement in the in the, that kind of courtship process, right? Because what we're just in the wild wild west, can just trying to make sense of everything, right, right? Whereas they have a proven solid framework, yeah. You know, where over time, over time, the rules can be bent, right? You know, so it's not like his parents had like that eventually happened, but it wasn't like the first thing. So I I started looking back on my own like messy, you know, track record and easily 95% of it was all chemistry and very little compatibility. Yeah. You know, ve like so, so a very extremely small percentage was lots of compatibility, but almost no chemistry. That's right. the fucking worst. First right. And then, but then once in a while there will be both, right. you know, and the only reason it doesn't work is if you're, if the timing's not right yeah, yeah, or yeah. geographically, you know what I mean? So, right. and th that's like actually the really, really hard, yeah. really, really hard. Um, but that, that made sense to me. Where is there a uh, level of a degree to which you agree or disagree to the chemistry compatibility component off the start? Like, is there anything more to add? Because I cannot find anything more to add to that. Like, what what is looking for a mate or or the courtship ritual for both man and woman, if not just testing for those two things? Yeah, you know what I mean. I can't think of a third. Uh, I love the idea of. Uh, I guess it's probably a compatibility piece. Mm -hmm. Is one or the other interested in using the relationship as a tool for growth? Oh wow! Okay. Because if if one is and the other isn't, yeah. Which normally we see now, which women are and men aren't. Because sure. We're behind on the consciousness scale. Yes. 
it's a recipe for frustration on their part and yeah. ultimately uh, oftentimes the, if not the demise of the relationship an under actualization of the female partner interesting because they don't have someone that's on board with them who says like yeah let's go to a workshop yeah oh we just had a disagreement we're both triggered in this effect let's take a deep breath five minutes apart come back and sit down and say okay what were you feeling what was i feeling it's normally like you go fuck yourself no you go fuck yourself right. blah 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 and they're off uh, negatively yeah um so yeah i do see I, I i agree with you compatibility and uh and and likability yes right so attraction yeah for sure for sure it seems like the modern day framework is men are trying to acquire consistent sex sure women are trying to acquire intimacy yes men will give intimacy when sex is provided. Mm -hmm. Women will give sex when intimacy, intimacy yeah. is provided. And so we're in this divine fucking conundrum yeah. that's a disaster. Yeah. Uh, men are getting less and less uh, willing and understanding and uh, engaged in actual intimacy as sex becomes more and more prevalent without it. Yes. Women, it seems like, I'll speak for the ones that I've spoken with, mm -hmm are getting more and more starved for actual compat or for actual intimacy right for actual consciousness right for actual quality and connection and connection yeah. and what really is at the root of a real relationship because there is no structure right because it's like all right it's the third date like why aren't we fucking mm -hmm. if we're not i'll just go find someone else who will right because now i have access to a million women sure when 20 years ago or 15 years ago, I had access to the 50 that were in my friend group, yeah. in my in my school program, etc. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I do. Th I can't think of something else to add except for that, which I think, you know, maybe I'm biased because of being so interested in the idea of conscious relating. Sure. That that is, if it's not a factor now, mm -hmm. it will be in 10 years. Yeah. As this shift happens and more and more people are saying, hey. The planet's going a couple different directions. Yeah. So many of us see the advent of technology and the digital revolution and how that's taking us further and further away from substantive feeling yeah. and consciousness. And so we're going to go hard towards that. Yeah. And how many people are then just lost mm -hmm. because they, one, aren't interested in, in consciousness. It's scary. They just never got exposed to it mm -hmm. or they're just not part of that group. You know what, I, uh, I remember when I had friends that were going through a rough breakup and they were both, they both were seeing separate therapists, which was good. Yeah. I remember what his therapist said to him that women are attracted to emotionally unavailable men mm -hmm. and they use sex as a tool to get them to emotionally invest. Mm -hmm. And men just generally want sex, right? Yeah. And so... Unconscious, men. Uncon yeah, of course. Yeah, and I was just like, dude, because and I I brought that up to guys that I knew. I I actually brought that up to women that I knew. Yeah, and um, like I I can't. I actually don't remember one person disagreeing. It's kind of a, it's a fucked up way of putting it. Right. You know, uh, and maybe maybe the the way the observation was worded is very bleak, but you know, th I I feel like. In, instead of just leaving the question there hanging, I I feel like your the way you concluded your latest statement had more hope for the future, in that we can coexist and we can there absolutely is a place where where both man's and woman's needs are met and it's blissful and only gets better with time. It does not it does not spoil with time. Yeah, you know and uh, like my first instinct is to ask if your current program has that, but like I, I sure, we're, sure, sure. we're slowly segue okay. into that, but you know, I, I do have hope. Okay. And it's not just to introduce the program. Yeah. It's because I work with within the program mm -hmm. and I work with so many men who also say, I just didn't know I was dissatisfied with the current model right. until I got exposed to the new model. Yeah. Because actually I don't want to be fucking three women a, a week off Tinder. Right. At some point, that's great for for six months. Mm -hmm. Then I go, wait a minute, I feel like shit. Mm -hmm. I'm also human. I'm missing out on this human thing called connection. Yeah. I'm just I'm chasing what's shiny and wet. Yeah. And that feels good for about forty five minutes. Sure. But holy crap, I actually have this side of me that wants to dive into a relationship as well. Yeah. There, 
granted, that's a population of men. Yes. There is a whole segment of population of a whole segment of the population of men who just aren't there yeah. and do not give a shit. Sure. And just aren't whatever. They just haven't reached that point yet. I said if we had like I can't draw it, but if if there was like a starting point and women uh, consciously were like eight inches extended to the right. Yeah. On the on this on the realm of consciousness, yeah. desire for consciousness, mm-hmm. having been in that area, working in it, men are like two inches. Sure. And that's that's <laughs> that, that's that, that's both in the depth yep. and the number of people involved. Yes. So you go to a workshop or anything that has that's growth oriented, yeah. that's not around strictly making more money or picking up chicks. And it's entirely, it's 90% female, 10% male. Wow. You go to something that's like, hey, it's a just a, a, a resource acquisition. Okay. How do I make more money? Sure. Right? How do I do marketing? How yeah. do I blah, blah, 90% male, sure. 10% female. Yep. So the the field itself, like the populate, the, especially, I can only speak here in America. Yeah. Men are dissatisfied. Mm-hmm. Men are in pain. Mm-hmm. Men are hurting. The the mass paradigms available to them do not provide a cure for that yeah. or a system within to work with, with within which to work to say, wait a minute. Oh, here's some light bulb moments. Here's some different ways I can act. Yeah. Here's some brothers that are, are going to support me in this way. Yeah. Yes. Does this exist? Sure. I'm not the one who made it up, mm-hmm. but I got introduced to it a couple of years ago and fucking light bulbs went off of going, Oh, I've been following this track that I thought I was supposed to as a dude. Mm-hmm. It didn't work. It didn't feel good. But I didn't know that there was another track. Mm-hmm. I didn't see anybody else on that track. Right. Shit. Oh, now I see it. And now I've stepped into this track. And oh my God, it's so much better. Yeah. So that's what gives me hope. Awesome. Right. I'm Again, I'm not a female. Of course. I'm not online dating as a female where I get exposed to the 10,000 I cannot imagine jackasses I, I, yeah I can't imagine uh, which is the mass population or is just the way people act online yeah I like I you know because I remember after the divorce and mm-hmm. the book and you did your year to live project which yeah. was amazing to watch from yeah. from my end as a friend and uh, from afar I don't want to spend too much time there just sure, because sure. you know but after after Traver's divorce and um, you know, Jim lost. He I left the gym. Left so the gym. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He I left. Yeah, after after Traver left, left the gym. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I, I knew there was a way to yeah, yeah. articulate that. But after Traver's divorce and after he left the gym, he embarked on this one year long mm-hmm. journey. You know, to from from my perspective, to heal and to to find himself and to mm-hmm. go through whatever he knew he needed to go through. And what he did was some of the most colorful. Mm-hmm. crazy unfathomable things like for example probably the most notorious one is your 30 month 30 30 month like 30 day stay in total darkness yeah. right on a vegetarian diet i thought that's i think that's fascinating vegan, vegan sorry yeah vegan Tw- diet. 28 days 28 days and yeah. uh if if you want to know more about that i will link um traver's gonna send me the link but i i will link that because you did a ted talk on it yeah and it's, it was amazing and so within the year you within your year to live to live project I feel like back then you were already unconsciously building the brand and, and building your following and you were already garnering uh, support and, p- yeah. and complete strangers who were like, dude, right. this is what you're doing is awesome and important. Right. And Thank I, you. Yeah, and I agree. And uh, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that you started consulting with, with uh, people who had gone through divorces. Yeah. But then that did something to you that led into your newest project. Yeah. Uh, could you speak to that before I go into the quote and then into your sure so talk about the idea of the people that I met that were actualizing my divorce no so so basically you it had it had organically gone from a one year journey of healing right into you into people asking you for for help yeah, or yeah, support yeah. or counseling on how to deal with the loss of separation right and you were uniquely qualified in that Right. But also, it, you yourself were paying a price for that. And so, therefore, right. you realized at some point that this was not something sustainable for you to continue. Or, yeah, yeah, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can yeah. you okay. can, Sure, sure, can, sure. Yeah, so I, you know, the, the idea behind the book was, was twofold. Like, the mm-hmm. core idea was pain is the greatest teacher none of us want to learn from. Okay. But we can. Yes. 
the second core idea of the book was every single day, no matter what we live through, even if, like actually the more awful it is, the more awesome it is because at the next day you're stronger. Yep. So I called it the one day stronger idea. And that okay. was it. Like every day, that's what got me through that fucking time. Yeah. Was yesterday sucked? Oh, I got served divorce papers yesterday. Yeah. That's the worst day of my life. Yeah. Okay. Today, I'm now someone who has survived that. Mm-hmm. I'm fucking stronger. Yeah. So as opposed to I'm broken down because of that happening. No, 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 no. It was a paradigm shift of saying everything that I've lived through is now making me rise up yeah as opposed to bringing me down yeah and that's not to say there was dissociation Mm -hmm. it wasn't like yay that was so awesome i loved it i still was human having a physical human experience of crying for 14 hours when that happened but then saying huh okay i'm now a guy who's gotten through being served divorce papers awesome get it on yeah okay if i could survive that what can i actually do yeah not what can i survive right what can i do right and so I was putting into action ideas of, okay, shit. All right, I can write a book. All okay. right, I've never written a book before. Mm-hmm. Okay, I can do this entire, I can sit in the dark for a month. Yeah. Fuck yeah. If yeah. I could survive this, I can do that. And so I was working with private clients who were going through their own divorces. But truthfully, uh, and mine was still so fresh, right. and I don't think I had enough distance from it, it was heartbreaking. Yeah. It's so heartbreaking to hear from a guy who just found out yesterday that his wife is fucking his best friend. Oh my God. Or a week ago or two weeks ago. And to listen to that man talk about now the situation that is his life. Yeah. Which is he's lost his wife. He's also lost his best friend. Uh, he's also living in this weird, fucked up reality right. that is his normal life minus those two people. Yeah. Plus a shit ton of pain. Plus this massive sense of being lost. Right. Right, being divorced is this crazy experience, Ab. It's like being underwater. Yeah, and you're just floating there. Right, because the rest of the world goes on. People get married. People have kids. People get promotions at their jobs. Right, and you're kind of stuck. Yeah, it's like being in jello. Right, right. So I would help pull people out of the jello. Okay, and say like, hey, what are you gonna do with this? That's mm-hmm. what I ask them. Like, mm-hmm. literally, this terrible, fucked up thing happened to you, or you know what? This is just a situation that you're in, and there's. Here's the deal. You just got handed a dump truck full of pain. Yeah. That pain is fuel. Mm-hmm. What do you want to do with it? Oh, you want to start a business. Yeah. Oh, you've always wanted to go to grad school. Oh, you want to give a TED talk. Yeah. Oh, you want to do X. Let's do that together and let's use the pain as fuel. Awesome. Because that's what I had done. Yeah. But. Again, it was just hearing the stories and having to hold space for people that were so heartbroken. Yeah. You know, I'm on the phone with people who are crying for 20 minutes. Oh, man. Day, and that's hour after right. hour, day oh, after day. Oh, my God. Right? It just got to be too much. Yeah. But what started happening as well is uh, more and more men started contacting me. Yeah. Where for the vast majority of my professional career as an acupuncturist, mm-hmm. as a trainer, mm-hmm. as a women's self-defense instructor, right. I worked with women yeah. and could relate to them in a feminine way yeah. with a strong masculine background. Yeah. But it was under-actualized. Sure. So I think as my own masculine strength. What, grew, what was under-actualized? My, my masculine sense. Okay. Okay. So it was just like, yeah, I'm a strong guy. Yeah. I have a strong sense of being yeah but had no strong sense of masculinity yeah my own path as a man like Mm -hmm. that term sure right like using the path of masculinity as a path to enlightenment actualization etc yes most guys consider themselves humans with a dick Mm -hmm. that's about as far as they think when i say like how do you relate to being a man right crickets (laughs) yeah how do you relate to your own masculinity sure crickets yeah right I hadn't been asked that those sure. questions until I started working with powerful men's coaches and yeah. men. Yeah. Um, but randomly, or not randomly, obviously, <clears throat> more and more of the women moved on because mm-hmm. they actually move on faster. The men would stick around, and I would have the same conversation over and over and over with them, yeah. which wasn't, how do you want to use this pain to move forward, but which was... Where did the chink in your masculinity armor Mm -hmm. or your sense of masculinity, which aspect of your masculinity was deficient or underutilized or under actualized that led to this experience happening? 
And when we get them all ramped up, mm -hmm. when we get you thinking, oh, as a man, I need to be grounded every day. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to meditate. I'm going to be calm. I'm going to like literally learn to control my inner state yeah. at all times or most times. Fuck, my life is radically different. Yeah. When I have integrity, when I have thought, word, and action in alignment, mm -hmm. holy shit, yep. my life suddenly becomes a lot easier. Yep. When I'm leading in every area of my life, from my relationship to my personal life, yeah. when I'm willing to make decision after decision after decision and take on the burden of those decisions maybe being fuck-ups, sure. I go, it doesn't matter. doesn't matter. I'm a leader. Yep. Holy shit, their lives started changing radically. Awesome. And so it was like, huh, why, first of all, why am I working with so many dudes? Yeah. Second of all, why am I having the same conversation over and over and over? Yeah. Third, why are all these guys' lives changing radically yeah. for the better? Yeah. Oh, wow. There's something going on here. I love it. Okay. I, okay, so before we go on, because this is, I feel like this is the trebuchet that's going to launch this thing <laughs> into the next thing. <laughs> uh, it, it was in 1998 where, I, one of the best classes I've ever taken under the, one of the best teachers I've ever had asked, what do you, what do you see is, what do you see as the biggest problem facing America today? Mm -hmm. And without question and without hesitation, I said, I see political correctness as the mm -hmm. largest problem facing America. I yep. was 17. Wow. <clears throat> um, and I think I only, I only knew to go there because I, I remember that being the start of that, of that movement where people would get offended by stuff and you had to cater to their offense versus you know so versus your own freedom of speech and i saw that as wrong like i saw that something was not right about it i understood i understood the intent behind it but we all know what intent mm -hmm. you know so uh but as I, mean, I knew that as a country we would have to pay a heavy price for setting this kind of precedent later on and mm -hmm. i feel like we're there now mm -hmm. if not the last several years but i've just been you know what blind but right um so and this is by the way not taking anything <clears throat> away from a lot of the women that have had to suffer under the hands of just uncouth and and irresponsible and evil men this is not that this is i see as a confusion of terms and a confusion of perceived rights right but uh one so so now flash forward uh there's a there's a guy jordan peterson who mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a big mm -hmm. fan of mm -hmm. um i was I two things were happening. I watched Traver's movement gain such momentum and such <clears throat> avalanching speed, and I'm so happy for him that it has almost <clears throat> engulfed. It has almost engulfed <clears throat> the the previous purposes of the podcast in that of this episode. I mean, and I want I, I as we were as the days started approaching, I actually wanted to get to direct more of the attention and energy of the podcast towards this, and I'm I'm super pumped about it. But I did want to preface it with uh, this thing that Jordan Peterson said that I, I, I wrote most of it down. But uh, essentially the theme of it was that the West has lost faith in masculinity. Mm -hmm. And I actually think that's true. Yeah, he, was being, he was being interviewed by a gentleman on, on a thing. You can literally look it up on YouTube. <clears throat> but it started off with the guy asking him, uh, what, do you, what do you see as, the, you know, as what's wrong with what's wrong with uh, like masculinity these days why are men in crisis is what he asked mm. him and he said I think it's because at a deep level the West has lost faith in masculinity that's no different than the, de than the death of God Nietzsche knew Nietzsche the philosopher knew what the consequence of that would be and that's most of what he wrote about and you would say the divine symbol of masculinity has been obliterated so then what do you expect is going to happen that mm. means masculinity is going to become weak especially if the symbol is also denigrated which it definitely is. The ideal that man can aspire to is denigrated, and with the symbol that man can aspire to is denigrated, then you're weak. That is definitional. So I think the reason men have been responding positively to my thinking is because I don't buy any of that. This is still Jordan Peterson talking. Right. It's necessary. It is not fundamentally carnage and pillaging. It is not fundamentally rape culture. It is not fundamentally world-destroying. And all of those aspersions have been cast upon it have been cast upon the definition of masculinity. Right. That's part of the guilt of Western society for technological progress even. And those are reasonable challenges to be set before men, I agree. But they're not reasonable accusations to swallow without criticism. Mm. And the guy asked him, what is, a mas <clears throat> what is a masculinity we can aspire to? And mm. I'm gonna go back to, before I tell Jordan's um, response to that, I remember when I was at your apartment and we were just like, 
you were we were tossing around the idea of what what does the idea of uh being a man to you mean mm-hmm. like or could you could you package them under four or five pillars type yeah. of thing and in the moment i actually couldn't answer it except for my own self right where a good friend of mine introduced me to the question of what are your three core values mm. and that took me a long time mm-hmm. but then it took me no time at all once you understood it and for me personally and i think it's different for everybody but for me personally it was vitality mm-hmm. physical vitality mm-hmm. honor and freedom mm-hmm. and those are my three and i think i i tacked onto that a fourth which was obsession, obsession. you know yeah, and, I and i actually still am yeah. there I, I still agree with it but here's jordan's thing because this guy essentially asked him what is what is a masculinity we can aspire to right and his response was well it's responsibility yeah fundamentally Huge. and when he said that i was like oh fuck right yeah to put it symbolically your responsibility is to incarnate is to incarnate the spirit of the logos that's your responsibility and that's your role in life that is, and then he he you know puts a disclaimer that is independent to some degree in whether or not you accept the idea of a transcendent and eternal reality, as if there's this like eternal and all like realizing kind of purpose or thing. Now I'm not making a case for that or against that because that's not part of the conversation. Those things are beyond human understanding, according to Jordan. But we know what happens if people act poorly, if men act badly. We know what happens. We know that the world turns into something that's so close to hell. That the difference is trivial. Yeah, that's the story of the 20th century, and holy shit, that's true. Right. So we should learn that lesson, and what the lesson is is, pick up the world on your shoulders and walk forward. Pick up the world with all of its troubles, with all of its suffering, with all of its evil, and move forward with it. And in bearing that burden, learn that you're the sort of creature that can bear that burden, and therefore deserving of respect. Mm. Fuck. Right. Yeah, and so, I, yeah, and so. That's identification with the logos. And I've never encountered an idea that's better than that mm. because it's so not naive. It is the opposite of naive. It's like there's terrible evil, there's terrible suffering, it is bottomless. But the human spirit is capable of voluntarily taking that on as a challenge. Right. And the guy asks him, that's where we get meaning? And he says, that's the positive meaning. Mm-hmm. That's the world affirming meaning. That's self esteem, let's say, which is very poorly characterized very shallowly characterized because it doesn't usually involve any sense of responsibility which is which Mm -hmm. is after thinking about it i agree but it's obvious in some ways if you look at the people that other people spontaneously respect right unless they become unbelievably cynical it's the people who adopt responsibility and deal with it competently so it's not a mystery that that would be what you could aspire to it gets undermined if you feel that force of responsibility that if you feel that force of responsibility is the rape is the raping and pillaging patriarchal culture that's despoiling the natural environment and is the equivalent to a cancer. So basically, if your definition of masculinity is that, of course, it's not going to work. Right. Obviously. And no, I don't buy that. And that was that was the, the quote. And so I listened to this two or three times. And after sitting on it, dude, I, I really believe that this is the state we are in in the world. It's it's. The the. We are we are reaping whatever seeds were sown <clears throat> 10 20 years ago mm-hmm. as far as as far as policy and culture mm-hmm. But I I see that only as good only as an opportunity and a huge one and a gaping one mm-hmm. and so It is not my space. It is not my space to to fill it is not that is not my like mission But right listeners. I feel like Traver my friend my brother has somehow through through all the bullshit because I knew in the back of my head that all the shit you were going through would ultimately serve a purpose and a huge meaningful one that would impact the world in a big way but you had to go through some shit first right yeah and he is now with his with his movement with man Unc- with the brand movement organization company whatever it is whatever man uncivilized is I feel like he is uniquely positioned and uniquely qualified to address this problem and to address this gap so thank you yeah man could you tell us about the mission and purpose of man uncivilized sure the mission at this point uh just starting off is to change the way a million men experience their masculinity okay to provide a positive paradigm so men actually provide a pathway yeah i said that before that men don't see most men are unconscious of the concept that they are just not big, strong humans with dicks. Sure. Period. Just animalistically. Sure. My my job is to make money, fuck women, and perhaps start a family. Mm-hmm. And that's even shifting. We're shifting away from that right now. Yeah. So the idea was 
how do I meld these two extraordinary versions of masculinity that I've experienced and I know intimately now? One is the divine masculine. Yeah. The second is the primal masculine. Okay. So how do we take both of those with most guys haven't heard of either? Sure. How do we take them both and where do they intersect? Yeah. And they intersect in my mind in a space that society hasn't yet created, which is why I called it, is it called it an uncivilized space. It is a man who is uncivilized or even decivilized. And that term triggers a lot of people. Like I get some shitty messages on social media of course. from women of course. saying, why the fuck are you uncivilizing men? You need to civilize them further. To which I lovingly respond, thank you so much, no I don't. Mm -hmm. Because the civilized version of masculinity, the civilized version of manhood or of men that we see is what we see looking around us. Yeah. It is uninspired. Yeah. It is un irresponsible. Yeah. Colossally irresponsible. Mm -hmm. It is undriven, unmotivated, unhealthy, yeah. unconscious. Yeah. It is all these uns. That's fucking civilized. Sure. So the uncivilized version is a conscious man. It is an empowered man. It is an inspired man. It is a driven man. It is a leader. A leader. Period. Oh. Fucking period. Mm. It is a healthy man. Men die ten years earlier than women do. Generationally. Yeah. We commit the like seven out of ten men who kill, or seven out of seven out of ten people who kill themselves are men. Yeah, it's not good. We lead the pack, and we leave er we lead every negative statistic practically of course. that exists. Yeah, that to me, snapshot, boom, that's civilized men. Yeah, okay, something has to change. Where are the disconnects? Where are and and is it simply that there's a lack of example? Is it simply that someone can go, wait a minute, and I did this, mm -hmm. right? I talked about this the other day. I had a men's group, a gathering in New York, and 25 men showed up. Yeah. And I said, "How many? here's my experience. I lived in an ashram. I lived in a spiritual center. I lived in the dark for a goddamn month and then came out and I met these beautiful men. Yeah. These men had an open channel between their hearts and God or hearts and the divine or hearts and the universe, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Their hearts were wide open. They were pure compassion. Awesome. They were just these, like, they were hippies. Yeah. And, and spiritual people. Sure. Right? And no offense to them. I respect them to no end. But I had a thought in the back of my head, having been someone who's been paid to fight in a cage. Yeah. If someone breaks into my house, I don't want this guy standing back to back with me right. saying, fuck it, let's get it on. Right. They aren't strong mm -hmm. in the physical sense. Not one barbell has been squatted. Not by one barbell has been squatted. Got it. Right? And then the second experience I had on the Year to Live project that was integral in this, I lived in the woods yeah. for a month in survival school yeah. with primal men, mm -hmm. with men who literally could like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go walk in the woods with this here knife mm -hmm. and this here water bottle and I'll be back in six months. Yeah. You're like, holy shit, yep. you are a fucking man. Yeah. You're different. Yeah. However, I didn't see the same connection they had to the divine, right. to consciousness. Right to holding space, yeah. to interrelationship with women, right. to inter integration into society. Yeah. Okay, what if I took the two and I put them both together? Mm -hmm. Because part of me is this deeply conscious spiritual person. Part of me gets off on the idea of beating the fuck out of someone in a cage. Sure. There, I have both aspects. What I learned in that dark room was denial of darkness and denial is equally as detrimental as denial of light. Yes. So yes. when I was going through my divorce, I was pushed to the divine side. Delve into spirituality. That's how you'll make sense of this. There's something divine at work in your life that just ripped the, the rub out, rug out from under it. Mm -hmm. The god Kali comes and burns everything to the ground. Okay, great. I really want to go deadlift too. Sure. I really feel like fucking killing someone right now. Yeah. What do I do with that? Right. Oh, you just turn it into, no, 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 don't mm. do that. No, I actually need to go back squat. Yeah. I need to throw weight around. I need to wrestle. I need yeah. to throw a kettlebell around. Yeah. I need to actually go walk into the woods and learn how to kill an animal with a knife. Yeah. Because I got to get back in touch with that barefoot man mm -hmm. that lives inside of me. Yeah. So that was, that's how it started. That was the mission behind it was how do I take these ideas, package them in a way that a guy sitting at his desk in Ohio, who's about to get divorced, who's 50 pounds overweight, who drinks five nights a week, who loves fantasy football but doesn't fuck his wife, right. 
is going, um, something's not right. I don't even know what it is, but I don't want to lose my family. Yeah. I'm not doing well at work. I'm just, I'm kind of wasting away here. Show me something. Right. Sh- lead me. Right. Teach me. Give me, a, give me something to aspire to and then give me the steps to get there. Awesome. And that's what it was. That's what it is. What does it, so is it a, is it a consultation program? Is it an online coaching program? Is it a book? Like is In it a, this iteration, because here's what happened, man. Like this came together yeah. and then it blew up. Sure. And it came together as a 12 week coaching program. I was like, hey, you, I want to work with you one on one. For the next 12 weeks, we're going to work on these 12 areas one by one. Awesome. Oh, and by the way, you're going to be meditating every day. Mm-hmm. Oh, by the way, you're going to be working out four or five days a week. Yep. Oh, by the way, we're going to take apart every aspect of your life and re push it through the lens of empowered masculinity yeah. because that is your true nature. Yeah. We have whitewashed it away, we've shamed it away, we've fucking de- denigrated it and degraded yeah. it, yeah. whatever the word is. By civilization, sure. let's give it back to you and say, oh, by the way, here is a massive piece of responsibility that comes with it. Yeah. So yeah, it was a 12-week coaching program. It still is a 12-week coaching program. It's going to be an online program, obviously. Mm-hmm. It's also a year-long program. Awesome. Where we go, okay, guess what? You've done the basis of the three months, but shit, it just doesn't go away. Right. You got to practice it. Yes. You got to be in touch with it. And... You've got, this is the challenge, man, that I understand conscious women and why they're so frustrated and alone and and lonely because I've taken guys through this program who go, now who do I hang out with? Sure. Uh, I don't really want to get drunk and watch football. Right. I really want to have a deep, intimate conversation with another man. Yeah. Who do I do that with? Yeah. So you go, okay, it's also a community. Mm -hmm. It's a tribe. It's a movement. Mm -hmm. I want a million men knowing that they have brothers all over the world and in their fucking cities and in their neighborhoods that they can say, hey, guess what? I'm struggling. I need some help. Okay, let me come talk to you. And also, guess what? I just did this amazing thing. I need to celebrate in a way that's not, let's go down a bottle of tequila and see if we can fuck 20-year-olds. Right. Uh, Let's celebrate in a way that actually works with our lives. Yeah. It actually empowers our lives. Awesome, man. And so now... Obviously, the it it blew up before you knew it. Yeah. Right. And it doesn't feel as draining as when you were consulting with divorcees. It's quite the opposite. Yeah. Can you? So, how do you feel personally? What is what is Traver getting out of this program, the Man Uncivilized program, and what it's becoming, and what it portends for the future versus what your divorce consultation thing was? I was exhausted at the end of the day talking to people who were getting divorced. Yeah. There, there were times when I would do, you know, four or five hours of one hour calls in a day mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. then just lie on the couch wasted. Yeah. Right? Where this one, I'll do four or five hours of calls in a day and then be like, I got to go to the gym because yep. I am bouncing off the goddamn walls. Awesome. Or it's two in the morning. I'm like, I can't believe that happened awesome. with that dude. Awesome. All of these wins, all of these unintended consequences that these guys experience. Of, yeah. My relationship is, I, I just, had sex five times with my wife last yeah. weekend. We hadn't had sex in three months before. Yeah. I got promoted at work in a way I never thought. They asked me to step up in this entire new position. I've made this much money as an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. My health has radically shifted. Holy shit, this is the third week of working out. I'm off this set of medications. Awesome. And you're like, I, I just, my my life is blown wide open. Awesome, yeah. man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so you, I think you actually answered this question mm-hmm. when you were describing it. But the way I the way I worded it was this: If a person's job is to help others improve X, then I see it as a professional and ethical obligation to define X. Mm. How would you define masculinity within the context of what you're trying to achieve with Man Uncivilized? And like and likewise, how would you how would those same parameters define femininity? Oh wow, I don't know. Let me get to the first one. Yeah, yeah. Masculinity. Okay the pathway that men have inherent inside of them to their own ask, a, actualization, empowerment, and for lack of a better term, enlightenment. Awesome. How do men most powerfully show up in their lives day after day after moment after moment, minute after minute? Mm-hmm. How are you the best version of yourself? You first have to be the best version of yourself as a man. Yes. Period, fucking period. Yep. If you are a guy. Yeah. So that is what I'm, I'm aspiring to with these guys. Before, Okay, so I love it. Sure. Before you attempt the second question, 
I'm going to make an attempt. Okay. Because I love that definition. If you replaced that with, if you placed that sentence, but every word that had man in it and replaced it with woman, right. would the definition work? I don't know. Okay. Because so, I think that the, the natural energetic drives, yeah. the, the natural, what's the right, the natural flavor of masculine energy yeah. is different than the ma- the different is different than the natural flavor of feminine of course energy. yes of course right you take two little two year four year old boys yeah put them in a room very different shit happens when you take two little girls and put them in a room of course and right? so it, and also with men and women and yeah. also with men and women yes right so i don't know okay that that much that much i like because I feel like people are lying to themselves when they try to have, first of all, I feel like people are lying to themselves when they try to make arguments that we are the same. We're not the same. We are not the same. Not the fucking same. A- like, Period. absolutely not. No, it's nonsense. Um, equality of opportunity? Absolutely. Yes. yes. 100%. Equality of, of freedom to pursue your own interests? Yes. Yes. But to try to impose an equal outcome of choice on these people where they otherwise would be unbound and free to choose yeah. is a gross and dangerous mistake. I Absolutely. Think. So, okay. I love it. Who, if any, are inspirations for the founding and direction of Man Uncivilized? Oh, man. That's a great question. Uh, you. Okay. Oh, really? Yep, absolutely. I had no idea. Yep. You, my uh, a good friend of mine, Adam Cobb. Mm-hmm. Like, guys, they're my teacher, Robert Masters. Okay. Um, on some level, Andy Petronic. Yep, Andy. Um, God, there, I've met a handful of inspirational men. Uh, my old boss, a guy named Fritz Allen. I talk about him in the book. Uh, it's a really great question. I have to think on this. Yeah, yeah. But Augie. Augie. Augie Johnson. Augie. Um, there are men in my life who I say, huh, what is it that you're doing that I'm not doing or mm-hmm. I wasn't doing? Mm-hmm. And, and if I compiled that like where where the bunches? Yeah. Most often, it's this extraordinary combination of leadership and responsibility. Wow. Period. Fucking period. Wow. Leadership in every single area of their own lives first, mm-hmm. and then leadership in their relationship, leadership in their business, leadership in their community. Responsibility meaning oh shit, every one of my actions has a. Uh, counteraction yes or has an effect yes has a consequence, has a consequence yeah period yeah therefore i'm going to hold myself to a standard mm-hmm. that is radically different than most than everybody else the 99 percent of the population yeah you know this when man uncivilized was 10 miles from existing yeah i had a conversation with one of my old coaches this was the last christmas party i was at at uh at my business at mm-hmm. cpc mm-hmm. and this woman came up to me a coach and said like why aren't you drinking and I had stopped yeah uh, the day my wife left I was like you know what I'm changing everything yeah I'm gonna quit drinking I'm gonna quit smoking pot I'm gonna quit looking at porn yeah I'm gonna quit doing getting I'm gonna get off social media I'm gonna start delving into consciousness mm-hmm. and she said do you realize that you're holding yourself to a stand like 99% of the population drinks smokes mm-hmm. a little bit mm-hmm. you know jerks off to porn on a little bit especially yeah. guys we're gonna yeah. like you know blah 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 and I was like that's amazing that would be the point I'm not going to, I don't want to be the 99%. Yes. I want to be the 1%. Yeah. And so part of my program is to say to guys, this is what it looks like. Mm-hmm. But, and rather, and this is the effect you get from living that way. Yeah. Look around. Yeah. Look at the other men in your life. Look at the men surrounding you. Mm-hmm. Women, look at the men you know. Yeah. Are they living in a, in a manner that you emulate? Right. If not, they can. They have that choice, yeah. but that choice comes with hard actions. That choice comes with giving things up mm-hmm. and taking things on. Very much, very yeah. much so. I, because I have female listeners, and I, I know that you also have uh, your female interactions mm-hmm. too. I'm going to take the would the same parameters define femininity? I'm going to take that because both of us are not sure, mm-hmm. right? I'm actually going to take that question away from the uh, the theoretical a priori framework and Mm -hmm. into the empirical framework and here's what it looks like does man uncivilized have any female members no okay what have you had any female uh, what have been the female responses to the program man uncivilized both good and bad sure and and i imagine you have interactions with the wives or girlfriends of the men involved that's a great question what have those what have those been let's go yeah 
I have female coaching clients yeah. who I work with in different capacities. Okay. I don't run them through a program that says the software of your life, whether you choose to accept it or not, is masculinity. Okay, of course. With the men, this is what happens. These are the two natural reactions I get from women. You're a fucking misogynistic prick. Uh-huh. I hope you die. Okay. And thank God. Yeah. Thank, it's like 99% thank gods. Yeah. 1% go fuck yourselves. That is awesome. Yeah. That gives me hope. And I think just because I'm an optimist by nature, even if it was reversed, if 99% you're a misogynistic <laughs> prick and I want to die, and only 1% said thank God, I would still be like, yep, that is yeah. all we need. Yeah. But the fact that it's 99%, that's saying something. Yes. That is saying something because just because... It is not. I'm not going to say that we don't know, but I'm going to say it is not in our purview, nor is it, nor is it within our mission to define femininity. Because one of my questions, maybe down the road, is like, you exist, man, uncivilized exists, which means I think it's only a matter of time before your female equivalent exists. And, of course. And what I mean is not in the like crazed, you know, not in the not in the not in the like way that's unhealthy and will help nobody. Right. But in the way that you have redefined and re reestablish a campaign towards a healthy almost destined masculinity for men yeah so too must there be your your uh compliment you know in the in the female realm so i of that i'm i'm actually extremely curious but it uh, already exists it exists to be honest yeah. because yeah. so many women are in the game of consciousness right so many women want to improve their lives mm-hmm. and do improve their lives every single day yes the challenge for them if i can speak for them sure is they're looking back and going hey we're the dudes where are the dudes yeah. and fuck why aren't you? and and this so to answer your specific question before yeah i talk with a lot of women who are at the point they say, like, will you work with my boyfriend or husband mm-hmm. because I'm outpacing him. Right. He's not doing anything. Right. He's not interested in growth. Mm-hmm. He's unmotivated. He's mm-hmm. lost his drive. He's lost his balls. He's lost mm-hmm. his mojo. Whatever it is. So we one, the fact that they're contacting me yep. often says that there is a, uh, a reversal of the masculine-feminine dynamic within the relationship. Yes. Where uh, this may not be a popular view, but... Because because societally we've kind of switched yep, it. Yep. More people are happy when the man is masculine and the woman gets to be feminine yes. in a relationship. Yes. There's a natural ease yes. that happens. Mm-hmm. And when it is reversed, the feminine will actually one it loses respect for the man yep. and the masculine. Two, they have to. It's repellent. Yes. They hate them. Yes. They literally will say, "I fucking hate when he makes me make the decisions. Yes. Why won't he just do X? Why won't he lead? Why won't he lead? Yes. Single women." And I say, I said this last weekend to a woman uh, at the workshop in San Diego. I said, imagine this, a guy who calls you and says, I'm picking you up Thursday night. I'll be there at seven. You know, it's semi-formal. So you you get to choose, but we're going to whatever. Mm -hmm. I've got dinner covered. I've got after covered. You'll be home by 11. All right. You good? Everything's taken care of. Yeah. I just want you to show up, have a great time. And that's it. Yeah. And then you know at the end of that date, that guy's dropping you off, kiss on the cheek or whatever. He gets in the car, you're out. Yep. If he's interested in you, he will tell you again. Yes. If he's not interested in you, he will also tell you that again. Yes. You will not have this gray zone. Right. You will not get ghosted. Right. You will not wonder if he's fucking anybody else or what it is. He's mm-hmm. going to say clearly, yes. hey, I really like you. Yep. I'm interested. I want to keep pursuing this. Yeah. Let's go out next Thursday. Yep. I'll pick you up at seven. I got this planned, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't mean that at no point in this courtship does, does she say, you know what? Hey, I really like to take you out. Cool. Mm-hmm. Let's uh, let's go get, let's do this. Mm-hmm. I got it covered. Mm-hmm. But eight out of 10, nine out of 10, yes. the guy is leading. Yeah. Right. And so when I say that to women, they literally go, oh, yeah. fuck. If only. That would be amazing. Yep. Where I've got these guys, uh, I talked to someone last night who said, in, in on the west coast a guy can't even pick dinner <laughs> I was like oh you poor thing that's her dating experience that is terrible it's like, and you know and it comes down to lack of leadership it yeah. comes down to lack, lack of willingness to take a risk yes so if I say and I, we can go into some of my own dating sure. stories which are absolutely fin- fantastic <laughs> where I've literally picked the worst thing that someone could ever possibly want to do yeah Literally, she said at the I had a date last summer, mm-hmm. and the woman said, "You have taken the things that I hate most in my life, yes. and you compiled them into one evening." You told me about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah this I was this the one. worst first date I've ever been on. 
And she said then, <laughs> yes. I hope that doesn't hurt your feelings. No. And I said, I high-fived her. Yeah, dude. I was like, hey, my job here was not to be psychic. Right. My job was to provide an experience. Yes. And I took a shot. Yes. And guess what? And, and guess what was the next day? She was like, hey, I'd really like to go out with you again. Yeah. And it wasn't because you picked the wrong shit. No. It's because you picked. I picked. Yes. I picked something. Given the definition and given what we know now. Right. It is the job of man to take responsibility and lead right. and to make decisions. And to provide for the experience, right. period. Right. It period was never about, period. <laughs> how are you supposed to know? And exactly. I think the feminine in her understands that. 100%. Uh, the feminine in her was, first of all, responded positively to the masculine in you. Right. Where she was felt comfortable enough and respected it enough to be like, hey, bro, you chose all the, the yep. exact opposite things of what I liked. But the but fact you that you liked it, the fact that you chose right. is enough. Like the and fact that didn't you didn't freak out when she said it. Right. It was like, hey, right. If I'd be like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Right. I can't believe I did that. Trust me. Just go out again. I'll make sure. up for it. It was like, nope. Yep. This is what I did. Mm -hmm. Had a great time. Yep. Sorry. It didn't, it wasn't, sorry. It fucked you up forever. Exactly. Therapy. Yeah. But let's go out tomorrow. Yes. See that, that is, this just occurred to me right now as, as mm -hmm. you were telling me that story. Humans are born with very little instincts we we if we were just if you were to take our technology away now and stick us in stick us in the jungles or the deserts or the mountains or whatever we would be the weakest oh god of all the animals yeah, yeah, we, yeah. we we do not have the speed or the strength right or the or the the nature given instincts to to dominate right but when you were describing if when you were talking to women about imagine this if a guy did Boom, 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 boom. Right. I have had, when I was listening to that, I was, I had the same feelings that, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I have a lot of very happily married monogamous guy friends uh -huh. and I'm lucky cause I'm surrounded by them. Right. Right. But they have told me and they have said of their own accord, you will know when it's her a <clears throat> and B she will make you want to be a better man. Absolutely. She will make 100%. you want to be. And, and you know. 100%. Yeah. I I remember when I was told that from so many of them. After they have told me to wait as long as I could. Yeah. After they have told me to be enjoy it as long as you can. Right. Yeah. But I think that's like half joking, I feel like. Right. But they were 100% serious when they said the, sh if you, the right woman will make you want to be a better man. She will make you feel more free, mm -hmm. more happy than you've ever felt. Mm -hmm. And once you put the ring on your finger, you all of a sudden feel like what you thought you could accomplish alone, you can accomplish a hundred times that with her by your side. And I didn't understand that when they told, I knew that they believed hundred percent that they were telling the truth. I believe them, mm -hmm. but it was not something that I could relate to until, you know, there were, there were, I think since nine, since Oh eight, I can say I've met two women where I felt like that. Mm. It's like, oh shit. Right. It's as if this, you know, of all the instincts we were not born with, I actually believe that men and women were born with very masculine instincts and feminine instincts. Mm -hmm. That with the right woman comes extremely naturally. Yeah. You know, like it, it's, it's not just, it's as natural as breathing. Right. You know, like, yeah, we're hanging out. I'm going to choose this. I'm going to choose that. We're going to do this. And it's not, it's not in some cavalier dominating, dominating way, no. but in it not being cavalier and dominating, it just assumes its rightful place. Right. You know, and it's so easy, you know, and, sh and they just love it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so I, I am going to, I'm going to actually put this out there and say that of all the things we were not born with, we were born with some things. Mm -hmm. And some of those things are, are masculine natures and feminine natures. And we already know that, <clears throat> it is detrimental and poisonous to try to hide them or run from them or deny them. We're think, seeing it right now. Absolutely. We the, are. That masculinity has been uh, shamed. Yes. And that natural masculine tendency has been shamed. Yes. They even give it a fake fucking term. Yes. Toxic masculinity. You're right. There's no such thing. It's no. literally a made up word. Yes. But now it's a category that we can put all things we don't like that men do. Right. Into that category. Right. Right, so Jordan Peterson's quote was correct. Yes, me, I am. I've never. People ask me, "Oh, do you think it's a really tough time right now to be a man?" I'm like, holy fuck, am mm. I proud to be a guy right yes. now? Are there a lot of douchebags on television getting called out for poor behavior? Sure, a hundred percent. Yep. Should they be a hundred percent? Guess what? The paradigm is shifting. Yes. We now, as men, 
our, that responsibility that we didn't take mm-hmm. is being forced upon us. Yes. Oh, you're a, a, a rapist on a date? Yep. Guess what? You're going to be on someone's blog tomorrow. Yep. Don't do that shit. Yep. Don't do it anyway. But now there's equal skin in the game. Yes. Right? So in that sense, men, we got away with everything. Yeah. There was the, the boys club. Yeah. Right? So I described this in a, in a blog post saying, imagine we were all football players in the NFL. And everybody got to hit, there were all these illegal hits and Mm -hmm. illegal plays, Mm -hmm. and no one really said anything. Everyone kind of looked the other way. Here's what the modern day is. If you do an illegal move in the NFL, you get kicked out. And guess what? They're going back and looking at old film. Yes, it's recorded forever. It's recorded forever. So, oh, that that thing, that incident you had in your 20s, you're still responsible for that. Yeah. It didn't disappear. Yeah. She can actually get on social media and say, yeah, this guy was a royal douchebag and he backed me in a corner and he said X, Y, and Z. Mm-hmm. So integrity has never been more important. But again, all of this stuff shouldn't be claimed because there's a negative repercussion. It should be claimed because it is the natural right. state. Right. And when a lot that natural state is aligned with, yes. men can go so far. Yep. So fucking far. There Sky's is the there is nothing like when you are one hundred percent in harmony and accord with nature. A hundred it's the, it's godly it's close to godliness. Yes, as close like as it. possible. Yeah. yeah. It's like and the, you know it's funny because we were both swimmers. Yeah. And I it's very rare a physical like I love CrossFit. Yeah. I love weightlifting and lo- like even sprinting as much as I don't like running. Yeah. I know how good it is for me. I know how like how great it makes me feel, but uh I love the water and I lo- and uh, it's like don't tell me when you're not swimming you actually you actually got a taste of that. I have no idea where that came from by the yeah. way. But we we're just like I'm just going with it. Okay. Right? <laughs> but yeah, it's it is when you are 100% in harmony and in accordance with nature, there is literally nothing like it. Right. There are no questions, and there are no, there are no, like preponderances of what you should do or what your next move should be. Right. You know, what? Okay, so I think you've answered this one. How do you see yourself and man uncivilized impacting the world three to five years from now? Um, as I've said, just getting more and more men to. Like, I want to wake men up. Mm-hmm. I, I mean it. Like, I want to walk around and shake them. Yes. And say, hey, guess what? There's a much better way. Mm-hmm. You've got to look at your own pain. Yeah. You've got to skillfully figure out ways to use your pain. Mm-hmm. We are, men are, there's an epidemic of male, of unexpressed male pain. Yeah. Unexpressed, skillfully expressed shadow wise yes right that is why we're abusive that is why we're rapists that Mm -hmm. is why we're killing each other Mm -hmm. it is the egoic expression of pain right as opposed to the skillful expression of pain so i see myself as facilitating this change yeah it's not my idea this this is coming through me Mm -hmm. uh and the bigger picture is just a mass movement okay of men who are saying like hey this isn't working for me yeah help me Mm-hmm. right give me some brothers awesome. give me some tools yeah I don't want to die 10 years before my wife sure. actually you know what I don't want to die 10 years before my third wife yes because now I've I've fucked up twice that's and what I've it got, is yeah oh, it's the truth that's the world we live in I yeah. don't want to put a gun in my mouth mm-hmm. it's at 55 because I am divorced I've been bumped out of middle management I'm 50 pounds overweight I have no drive yeah. I have no purpose I'm isolated and I'm drunk yeah so let me just fucking end it yeah. Right. Which is, it's an epidemic. It's yes. a literal epidemic. And I, I say this knowing there are a lot of epidemics. Yeah. This is the one that found me. Okay. No, I like it. Like I said before, you're, you are uniquely positioned, uniquely qualified. You have, you have the experience and the want to do it. It's, it's kind of like, that's a very rare combination. And that's why I'm so, that's why I'm so happy that you are in the position you're in. It's it's the it's it would be the opposite if you met a six foot eight, three hundred fifty pound muscular guy who wants to paint. <laughs> like it's like okay, little football. It's like no, I just love I just like the the brush and, and the colors. It's right. like you are in the you are in the right time at the right place, you know, at the right moment, surrounded by the right people with yeah. the right resources. Right. Shit is just coming together for you. I can feel it. It's yeah. like in avalanches, right? Yeah, it's been massive. It's and, been almost overwhelming. Oh man, I mean, I'm just like enjoy it, you know, because I know what that feels like. Yeah. Um, I and I know you're in a period of transition right now, but I also know that you're going through some sh- through some stuff. So, my next question is: What are your own? What are Traver's three to five core values? 
Ooh, yeah, core Cause, values. Because mine, you know, obviously you know yeah. mine. Like, but my it took time. It took time for me to like dig, and it yeah. took time for me to like, oh fuck, what what am I about? Like, what right. what what is it that I associate with myself, and that's that may or may not be different than what people associate you with, you know? But right. uh, what helped me answer the question was, what do I spend my time and money on? Yeah, that also, yeah, that yeah, also, yeah. you know, was there. That that is what provided me with one, two, and three. Yeah. You know? So first and foremost is strength. Okay. I am obsessed with strength in every capacity, though. Yeah. I'm not the physically strongest human on the planet, mm -hmm. nor will I ever be. Yeah. Nor do I want to live in a gym. Sure. Nor do I want to be a power lifter. Yeah. I want to be strong in 50 different ways. Yeah. Internally, externally, spiritually, consciously, physically, all of it. I say, and I probably stole this from someone else, strength heals. Yes. Strength cures. Mm-hmm. Strength is the foundation upon which I have built my life yes. and upon which we all build everything that we do build. There, I've never met someone, nor have I been in a situation that, I've, that that person or that situation said, God, you know why this fell apart? Because I was too strong. I'm yeah. just too strong. You know? and like, yes. If I could just dial my strength back, like 30%, yeah. life would be a lot easier. No, not one time. Not once. So first and foremost, uh, the cultivation of strength is an obs is my obsession it's your fourth your pillar right mm -hmm. obsession i love it i love it yeah how do i get stronger in every way yes how can i sit that's why i went in the dark yeah how can i sit for 12 hours at a time without moving yeah how can i have strength of relationship how can i have strength of consciousness mm -hmm. how can i have strength of presence yes right so i guess second value would be presence awesome how can I, it's why I quit drinking. Mm -hmm. It's why I quit smoking dope. Mm -hmm. It's why I quit a lot of, doing a lot of stuff yeah. and started doing a lot of other stuff. Yeah. How can I dissect the present moment into millionths yes. and experience each one of those, one cascading into the next, after the next, after the next. Yeah. So that I'm not obsessed with what happened in my past. I give that grace and let it go. Nor am I fretting about the future or fantasizing about the future. Yeah. Like literally staying in the place of my work is right now, right here. I love it. Yes, I have some projections of, you know, I've got six month goals. I've mm -hmm. got year long goals, mm -hmm. but they're not going to happen. No. Unless I'm, they will happen more as quickly as I am present. Yes. So bam. That's, awesome. That's the second. Awesome. Uh, integrity. Okay. And I use that word as I described it before. Thought, word, and action okay. in alignment. So that's like a, it's a daily action as opposed to this ethereal concept, yeah. which is like, oh, integrity, like everybody likes that word. Yeah. Like when people, you get a lot of generalizations, like integrity, freedom, truth. Right. Sure. Okay, great. Now you're just masturbating with poetry. Of course. Of course. Thought, word, action, and alignment. You know, I, just really quickly, I, sure. I read, um, there was a definition of how a person can, how a person can subconsciously detect the presence of a psychopath. Mm. Or the presence of a sociopath, in or or even a psychotic, in that there is incongru incongruity, mm -hmm. incongruency, whatever incongruity. It's, yeah, yeah. There's incongruity between their words and their deeds. Mm. That is that was literally the defining term. It's almost like how insanity is repeating the same bullshit, expecting the same result. Right. Is is actually the clinical definition of insanity. Right. Where the the independent variable on how people can tell. A sociopath from other people is the incongruity of their words and of their mm. words and actions, which is crazy, you know. But anyway, okay, so strength, presence, presence, and then integrity. Integrity. Is okay. there a fourth or that? That's the fourth that I don't know. I don't know if it's a uh, a core value, but it's or a skill. It is the ability to hold space. Okay. And even just understanding what does that mean? Yeah. Right. So that comes back to. Uh, understanding of emotionality, mm -hmm. understanding of emotional range, yep. which is huge for men. Mm -hmm. Like, do you understand? Can you actually name seven emotions that you feel, seven feelings that you have throughout the day? Do, can you do it? Are you happy, sad, frustrated? Okay, angry, okay, all right. You know, like heartbroken, depressed, mm -hmm. or whatever it may be. These probably aren't clinically the right definitions, right? Or do, are you literally uh, checked out and angry? I see. Or, or angry, which is most guys. I'm like, I'm, I'm working or I'm angry. Can you can you bridge the difference? Sure. Can you bridge the difference between 
being aware of what your emotional state is in the moment versus um, can you reconcile that with holding space? Holding space is the ability to sit in front of someone else mm-hmm. and allow them to have the full range of their own emotional experience yeah. while holding on to your own. Uh, so if you were to sit here and cry, yeah. I can breathe through that yes. without either crying myself right. or saying, stop, yeah. that's too much for me. Right. Fuck, why, why are you always fucking crying? Right. right? Which is for men, mm-hmm. the ultimate skill because we deal with, most of us, the emotional being, which yeah. is the feminine, yes, which changes form emotionally a thousand times in a second. Yeah, where if we're chasing that down, or trying to stop it, or damper yeah. it, or or what it was all guys say, she's just fucking crazy. Sure, she's not crazy. Yeah. She just has a different experience and expression than you do. Right. So the ability to hold space is yeah. something I hold dear. Uh, it is what I kind of think of like a superpower mm-hmm. that all men can develop. And yeah. when they do develop, life becomes radically different. Awesome. I love that. And so I would say, you know, of course, adventure. Fuck yes. yeah. Of Obsession. Course. Let's like I can name yep. 50 of yep. them. Yep, yep, yep. Um, ins- you know, I don't, yeah, we'll just call it that. Okay. Amazing, man. I love it. So just, so again, mm-hmm. strength, mm-hmm. presence, mm-hmm. integrity, mm-hmm. holding space. Space holding, yeah. Space holding. Yeah. Awesome, man. Uh, I am pretty sure people are going to ask for like an outline of that. Mm-hmm. I'm sure Traver can work something up. Sure. I'm sure it's going to be in your next book. Yeah. Or something. Man on Civilized, due out 2019. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So we're going to take a break uh, in a little bit, but before we go on it, so just for, for your sake, the next question I'm going to ask him, uh, we're going to harken back to years ago. Sure. Uh, I remember we had this awesome sesh on at the, <clears throat> at the Venice Boardwalk. I think it was Venice Ale House. But anyway, we had a bro sesh that concluded with we can have it all. Do you mm-hmm. remember that? Mm-hmm. How, if at all, has your mind changed in that conclusion given the evolution of your own project since then? For example, your book, your TEDx talk, Men Uncivilized, and your consulting, etc. So let's, you sure. know, it's like, sure, so sure, like, sure. you know, sit on that until we come back. Okay. And uh, I'll talk to you guys in a bit. <laughs>